Okay, we're going to start um, now. Uh, uh, good afternoon. Um, good evening. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, namaskaram to everybody. Uh, once again, I'd like to welcome you all for, for our uh, second series of our medical careers um, program. Uh, our first series was a generic UK career opportunities. The second one is about the CVs. Um, and uh, first of all, let me introduce, we we are ex from Excel UK and we're doing this in partnership with CG. Uh, we have been in a lot of programs together. Uh, let me first introduce um, our Chief CG Coordinator for Education, uh, Mr. Zakaria. Uh, can you say a few words to us, please? Uh, Zakaria, I bow to you. Can you unmute? I guess I've unmuted yourself. You have to unmute. Un okay. Oh, yeah, yeah okay. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, okay. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, let me welcome you all for this uh, program, Medical Careers in UK, CV Essentials. And the program is jointly. We can't hear you. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, we can. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Jointly organized by CG and Excel UK. Now, a few words about Center for Information and Guidance India. CG is a non-governmental organization with headquarters in Chevayur, Calicut, Kerala, India, and chapters all over Kerala and other states in India and Middle East and also a few other countries. CG was launched in 1996, and we are going to celebrate our Silver Jubilee soon. CG is a voluntary charitable NGO engaged in activities aimed at educational and social development of the society, with special emphasis on marginalized segments. Our vision is the society empowered, self-sufficient, vibrant, and influential. And our mission, education with a purpose, employment by passion and choice, excellence in all aspects of life, empowerment with character. As part of our policy to provide reliable, useful, and authentic information from the right people, we are very happy to associate with EXL UK for a series of programs. We sincerely thank EXL UK on behalf of the youth assembled here for providing this selfless service. And let me congratulate the youngsters here for making use of this program. And the services provided, our services provide include educational and career guidance, free psychometric tests, diploma courses in career guidance, HR development programs, including camps for students, grassroots development programs, scholarships, language development programs, employability enhancement program, et cetera, et cetera. And today, this program, you are already uh, watching the details of the program since I am not mentioning. Let me uh, hand over the program to Dr. Riaz. Riaz, sir. Uh, Zakir Saib and uh, a big thanks to CG again. Uh, we have been in a partnership for a, for a, for a long time. Um, uh, we have been doing these programs together. I think the CG Association lasts for about six years now since we started uh, as an organization. Now, Excel UK is, uh, is the education and career wing of, of, of CAMP. Uh, UK, which is our parent body, and we are a group of uh, Muslim professionals all over UK. Um, uh, luckily, we have a lot of our founder members here, and I think the first and foremost, I need to let let all of you know that this uh, this is a group of professionals, especially the doctors, who have been here for 15, 20 years. They have a lot of experience in careers and education, and we have seen a group of people who came here, did the hard bit, and got here. Uh, in the end. So I think, uh, I hope, you know, it'd be very useful for you. We've been doing this program for a long time. Now we are involved in training, we are involved in interviews, we're involved in, uh, you know, uh, getting people to improve their CVs. So all sorts of things that you would expect uh, and, and hope 
the people who are aspiring to come to UK would need. Um, about Excel UK, Excel UK is, 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 is into education and always our, our parent body, our aims were into education and training. Uh, we are involved in all sorts of education, including medical education, technical education, IT, uh, finance, uh, and all the other sort of uh, career development programs for all age groups. Um, and uh, this particular program is, is, is a medical careers program, and we are going to do our second one. The first one, like I mentioned before, was a, a generic um, uh, careers opportunities in, in the UK. Uh, and this one is more more specific into uh, going into, you know, what your CV should look like. Now, uh, we all agree that your CV is a, your gateway to your profession and the CV should look as, as good or even better than what you actually are. And you should be able to demonstrate that in your CV. That's why this is so important, because this is sadly one of the areas that is missed um, in our um, in, in our medical curriculum back home. Most of us have been um, have been, uh, you know, uh, in um, in various situations, you know, from abroad, came here, but at different points and different times, we need that we need a support and help. So that's what's that's, that's very important to note. Um, and with that, I think we need to start the program. And I'd like to uh, invite our first speaker. Um, uh, before that, uh, let me just tell you, uh, give you a bit of a uh, synopsis about the program. We are going to have one hour of uh, lectures. And after the one hour, uh, one hour lectures, roughly about 50 minutes to an hour of lectures. And after that, we have the Q&A session. The most interesting bit of these sort of programs we're doing is a Q&A session. Now, the initial part of the Q&A session, in which all our panelists will be there, we would aim to look at a few CVs which you have kindly shared to us, shared with us, uh, and with your consent, and after anonymizing your names, we'll be looking at them, and we'll be looking mainly at how a CV looks like, and these are people at different stages in their career of coming to UK. Uh, and, and then after that, we go into the proper Q&A session. Now, I would encourage all of you to type your questions in the chat window as and when we do the talks so that we can try to answer those questions as and when we can, and then try to minimize the questions uh, and, and discuss only the very important questions because the Q&A session will follow after that CV, uh, um, CV discussion session. Um, so without further ado, let me go on to the first uh, talk. Uh, the other thing I want to say is most of our, us are giving our opinions. Uh, there is a disclaimer that uh, you know this should not be taken as the final word. You've got to do your own homework about what you've got to do. And, and also, we are covering a lot. So it's very basic stuff that we're going to cover in our talks. So the, don't expect the whole thing to be covered in one or two hours. Um, so uh, and I, again, a big welcome to, to you all. And let me introduce our very first speaker, um, uh, Dr. Rafiq. Dr. Rafiq, um, we, 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 you know, we know we've known each other for so many years. Uh, Dr. Rafiq is one of our most senior most members in, in, in the United Kingdom. He's been here for almost 25 years. He's been a consultant for about 20 uh, years or so. And I think he's our most experienced. He's got over 20 years of experience. Um, you know, in training and teaching. Uh, he's worked as a pediatric intensivist for about 13 years, and for the last 11 years, he has been heading the pedi pediatric uh, endocrine and diabetes team, working along with uh, in, in, in general pediatrics. Um, so he has been a, a big, uh, big sort of influence for all the pediatric trainees as a consultant pediatrician in the North Midlands area. So he works in the University Hospitals of North Midlands. Uh, he's also got a fellowship in critical care um, uh, from Toronto. Uh, he is an examiner for MRCPCH. So all of you are taking MRCPCH exams. You'll be, we'll be very happy. Um, he's also a previous PLAP2 examiner. And uh, in addition to that, he's got a lot of roles which you know we, we can't cover and he's one of our main backbones of our CGN camp uh, and, and you know even some of our mentors as well including myself um, so uh, without further ado let me hand it over to Dr. Rafiq. Dr. Rafiq is going to talk to us about what a CV should look like you know what we need to have in all of you have CVs but what is what is UK CV what a CV in the UK for a doctor should look like that's what he's going to talk to us about over to you Dr. Rafiq um, uh, your turn. Thank you very much, uh, Riaz. Okay, um, yeah, everybody able to see my screen? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, 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 we can. Yeah, okay, so the plan is if I take you through what a CV looks like and what I mean by that is um, some tips and tricks on how to do a CV a little bit about what the CV should contain and what, as we go along, the rest of the talk will then fill the meat to the bone to add on what the bits that I've talked about, how to generate that in real life and then how to then fill that in your CV, okay? 
So what is your CV? The CV is a bit, was described as a bit of a shop window. So where it involves selling yourself, um, a bit of showing off what you can do. And that's not something we in the subcontinent are very good at doing. And when you come across to the West, you realize very quickly how much we lag behind in trying to sell ourselves in what it is that we do. So the whole point of the CV is to sell yourself. Um, and, and what we will go through now is to what are the tips and tricks that we need to do that. So the first thing about creating a standout CV, there is a difference between an application form and a, and a CV. So what you really need to do is to prepare a master CV over time where you write down everything that you ever want to include in your CV. And then when it comes to doing a particular CV for a particular post, read the instructions. Make sure you go through what is required in that application or in that job and tailor your CV to that. So if, if, if it says that you need a particular specification, a particular criteria, make sure you include that. Read the specifications. And if you're exceptionally good at something beyond that, then you can always add that in, but don't forget to cover the core elements that are required. So your CV, you're not looking at 20 pages in a CV, you're looking at two or three pages. And the important thing about that is the first one, should, the first page should contain as much information as you can without going into too much detail. So it's how you attract somebody's attention with the first page. So highlight your achievements rather than going through in great detail. Yeah. And the other thing you need to do as well is, again, look at the specialty, what you're applying for, look at the grade, what you're applying for, and you work that in. And I'll explain a little bit more in detail about that. So again, the, the language that you use in a CV sometimes is very important. So, you know, if you write something like, I've been involved in a number of audits, or I attend meetings on a regular basis, what does that mean? That means nothing to me if I look at a CV. So this is what's called loose wording. Whereas how you convert that into something more substantial is by using words that indicate your behavior or your role in that particular project. So how you contributed to something, how you modernized something, how you implemented something. So those are the words that you're looking for. Hopefully we will share this presentation at the end so you can take some tips from this as well. What we need to do is you should never have substance, should always have substance over style. Don't let the style overtake the substance. So be concise, be consistent, um, and don't try to be very fancy with what you do. And I'll explain a little bit more detail about that. So when you, when you write dates, make sure you write the most recent first. Um, make sure you highlight your skills in your CV. Don't waste space, okay? Most people who are reading these, have maybe get 100 CVs at any one time. So they, you need to capture their attention. So the, the font that you use is important. So you stick to simple font, you know, stick to Times New Roman or Arial when you do fonts, stick to simple 12 point fonts. And the other thing is consistency. What you shouldn't do is do a 12 point font somewhere else and do an eight point somewhere else, you know, do a Roman somewhere else or an Arial or a Calibri somewhere else. Make sure you're consistent throughout your CV in what it is that you use. Avoid solid blocks of text. It's interesting. The actual block of text that I've written to highlight that has got too many blocks of words in it. So try and keep it simple, okay? Just two or three words in one line if you can. So the idea is to make it stand out so that the moment the, ex the person looking at the CV, um, looks at the CV, it stands out at him. But whatever you do, do not fabricate or embellish any information because you will be caught out. If they ask you anything in your CV, in your interview, you should be able to substantiate that. And also, obviously, if you make things up, you will be held accountable by the General Medical Council. Okay. And the other final bit about that is your CV is there to get you uh, an interview. Okay. So don't write opinions there. Just write facts. Opinions can be discussed in the interview. So don't write things like, I really enjoyed this post because of this. Just be factual about what it is that you did. Okay. So a little bit of a running order. So what we like in medicine is people are still very old fashioned in medicine. You know, we don't go to work in t-shirts and jeans like you would do in any other field. So we stick to the same old run of the mill thing. So if you look at it, personal details, career statement, education qualifications, present position, career history, clinical experience, a little bit of management and leadership experience. Again, I'll explain this in detail. And the last one is the referee. And these other bits that I'm talking about, these bits will, the, the following um, colleagues will, will actually explain in a bit more detail. So your name, contact details, GMC, MDU number, if you have one, 
don't bother writing what your date of birth is or what your marital status is or how many children you have because more often than not, a lot of places would take that away from the CV for equal opportunities purposes. Don't put photographs in because we're not interested in choosing a particular type of person. We're interested in what they did. Then your educational qualifications, career statement. Career statement, again, if you are writing something there, make sure it's, it's oriented to the job that you're applying for. Like I said, you can create a generic CV at home, but highlight from that the points that will help you get this job. So outline your clinics experience and skills to make you suitable for this particular position. So if you're somebody who's undecided and who's just done their house job and you're applying for a job in anesthesia or respiratory medicine, then pick out from your job, from your job so far what it is that will help you achieve a job in, in respiratory medicine anesthesia. So you highlight what it is that you've done. So always do in reverse chronology your current appointment and then work backwards. All your previous experience must be there. And your relevant and additional experience, you should always write relevant experience, but if you have additional experience, you can then add it under subsequent headings, yeah? The final bit is about professional development courses and, 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 and conferences attended. It's always useful for the people employing you to know that you're committed to personal development. So any courses that you've done, list it, what the title of the course was, and also when it was attended. Similarly, with research experience, if you have a lot of research experience, if you've done any research experience, then write the title, the topic, the time spent, what your supervisor was, what the aims were. These are things you can write a little bit more detail to try and sell yourself, yeah? Again, clinical audit. If you do, if you're writing something on clinical audit, then you should write a little bit more detail about what it is that you did. And this is where those other bits that came in, rather than saying, I did the clinical audit, this is where you can write words like clinical effectiveness, where you implemented change, you changed the, the, the quality improvement of the program. So whatever it is that you're able to achieve, rather than just what you did, but what you achieved is actually even more important. So similarly, presentations and publications, if there is anything that came out of your research or clinical audit or teaching experience extra, you can add that in. Leadership skills. Again, this is a generic talk. You might not, you feel like when you're applying for your first job, oh, what is it that I'm having in terms of leadership? So you need to understand what leadership and, and management is about. So management is the art of doing things right. Whereas leadership is the ability to identify the right things to do. Yeah. So being very timely about what it is that you do. So some, some people are good leaders, some people are good managers, and sometimes they're both good leaders and managers. So in a junior CV, the things we will look at to, to include leadership potential would be served as a captain for the school rugby team, was president of the medical students union, to, did the rota, was the junior doctor's representative, you know, things like that are useful to put in there. Computer and IT skills, it's worth putting in a little bit about, you know, especially nowadays when the whole thing is uh, moving towards that, if you use specialist software or you can use statistical packages or reference manager, things like that, put it in. But you know, don't put in things like I can use Photoshop if all you've used it for is to edit your holiday snaps. That's pointless. But if it's something that's relevant, do. And a little bit of a language skills. If you can speak some of the languages of the Western world, then you can say to what level, whether it's conversational, or whether it's written, level one, level two, or if you speak a lot of Indian languages, just say I'm fluent in seven Indian dialects. Don't bother listing all of them. And the final bit is about special interest. You know, strike a balance between trying to making it exciting, but actually making it useful. You know, what I mean by that is, instead of writing, I climb Mount Everest every week. If you said, I look after my kids and I enjoy interacting with them, that makes more sense. That's what we look for. You know, it's that human interaction rather than saying, you know, I'm so and so and so and so. And having fun or um, drinking with mates is not particularly useful as a special interest. The final bit is if you've done anything else exciting outside this, by all means put it in. If you've taken a year out and gone to um, Africa, gone to Maldives or Andamans and helped people, you can always put that in, yeah? And referees, always, before you put your referees in, make sure you contact them and take their permission. The last thing you want them to say, who is this person? And when you're doing it, don't add just a postal address, also add an email address. Okay, so that was a quick whiz through because I only had 10 minutes to do that. So it's important that we, I stick to time, but I'm hoping that these sessions will be broadcast and these slides will be shared if people want to do that, yeah? Okay, so I'm now going to stop sharing my video.
And what I will do now is introduce my next speaker. Okay. Um, so the next speaker who, who we will come on is Dr. Riaz Abdullah. As, you know, he's everybody is familiar with him, and now it's my turn to repay the compliments that he paid me. Riaz is one of the founding members of Camp, and by default, Excel UK as well. And he's the, he's the driving force. I mean, let's make no bones about it. He's the driving force behind this organization. But he also happens to be a consultant in elderly and general medicine and head of movement disorders. He's also got a lot of background and um, experience in uh, education and training. He's a regional specialty advisor for medicine at the Royal College of uh, Physicians in Glasgow. He's also a senior lecturer and interview panelist. So he's somebody who's actively involved in looking at your CVs and helping with recruitment. So without further ado, let me hand over to Dr. Riaz Abdullah. Those of you who are not in, can you hear me? Yeah, yep. okay. Yeah, those of you who are not in UK would probably be wondering and scratching your head what clinical governance is. Now, clinical governance is a very, very strange terminology that most of you are not familiar with. Yeah, so I think it's very important to know what this is. I'm going to tell you briefly in the next 10 minutes what clinical governance is and what is this relationship with a CV. Yes, uh, the relationship with the CV. We've got to make it very, very clear what the relationship with the CV is. Yes, and then you will know once after the talk, hope I will be able to convince you what the relationship is. Now, one of my key objectives is to tell, talk to you through a bit of basics about clinical governance. What are the pillars of clinical governance? And then, as I mentioned before, to explain the link between the CV and the clinical governance and a means to establish the link. Yes, in your CV. Right. What does the definition mean? It is one of these, when we came to UK many, many years ago, the first thing they asked is, what is the definition of uh, clinical governance? That's about nearly about 18, 19 years ago. And this was what, it was very, very hot topic then. And it is a framework through which the NSS organizations are accountable for continually improving the quality of their services and safeguarding high standards of care by creating an environment in which clinical in which excellence in clinical care will, will flourish now this we used to learn this by heart before we go for the interview about 19 years ago having no clue what this was all about basically it just means that you have to provide excellent quality of care and is the frame as a means in which we ensure by the regulators that this quality care is being produced okay now you imagine you're having your first job in the united kingdom and then you're thinking about the seven pillars of clinical governance now that's going to be a tough one isn't it so to put it in simple terms i'm just going to ask you the question i'm not asking as an interviewer as a person as a senior consultant is i'm looking for a junior person to work for me i want to know that ensure myself this person is safe the person is honest has he got adequate knowledge of guidelines and protocols and policies is there any evidence of knowledge of clinical audit in the CV? Does the doctor involve in quality improvement programs? Is the doctor a good teacher? Can the doctor work in a team and can be led and can lead a team? And does the person update this knowledge? That is essentially what clinical governance is. So if you think about this in these terms, you see that clinical governance is very, very important for a CV, right? Now I'll just go to the seven pillars of clinical governance. There you are, you should be able to do an audit. Clinical effectiveness, we'll leave that for now. It's mainly for seniors. You should be able to involve in research, have a bit of publications. Whenever you work, you should be open and honest about the problems you did. And if you make a mistake, you always have to own up to your mistakes. And you can show some evidence of that in your CV, mainly in this in the, in, is in the portfolio. And risk management, how you manage risk. And also you have to show evidence that you continuously update yourself by going to training programs and getting your exams and clear exams. So this is all clinical governance. So when you're having all this, you can ensure that you're going to be a safe doctor. So hope that makes sense. And what is an audit? This is a common question that a lot of people in India ask me. We don't have a clue about the audit. We have been through a lot of your CVs. I could not point out a pinpoint audits in them. It's very, very few of the CVs showed audit. And this is very fundamental to UK practice. An audit, by definition, by NICE, is a quality improvement process that seeks to improve patient care and outcomes through a systematic review of care, 
against an explicit criteria and the implementation of change. Now, that's a lot of a handful for you, but I'll try to explain that in a simple term. I'm just going to briefly tell you about our audit. We've got a, uh, a talk of audit com coming next. So basically, identify a problem. Let's say you are managing somebody with myocardial infarction or uh, ischemic heart disease. Then you've got to obtain a standard. What is the best way of um, you know, treating or diagnosing ischemic heart disease? Then you see how we actually treated that patient over a period of time. And then you have to compare our performance. You're just auditing your performance with what the standard is meant to be. And then you say, actually, we haven't done well. There's a few things we need to do. Let's implement a change. And then you introduce a change. It could be a pathway. It could be teaching. It could be education. And then you re-audit and then go back to the issues and see if the issues still exist. This is how you complete an audit cycle, okay? Now, there's a big difference. Now, there's a lot of drive recently over the last 10 years about for quality improvement programs and quality improvement projects. Now, this is actually closely linked to audit and clinical governance. And it's basically when you close an audit loop and you make a big change in the care of the patient, i.e. You, you had a big improvement in the care of the myocardial infarction patients, it becomes a quality improvement project and a program. So the full cycle is there. You can see in the United Kingdom, there are a lot of safer patient initiatives, the safety thermometer, a lot of patient safety programs, and you have a lot of patient safety incident data in which incident reporting happens on a frequent basis. If you make a mistake, there is a process in place, and you look through that process, and you do implement a quality improvement program to actually prevent that mistake or happening. Drug errors, medication errors, all these sort of things are about quality improvement programs. I'll give you a simple example of a QIP. Let's say you are treating urinary tract infections. All of us treat UTIs on a frequent basis. So you look at the diagnosis and you're looking at the treatment and there's a standard. And you audit what we are currently doing. Are we actually following that as per the current standard? And then we identify that we are not doing as a current standard. There are a lot of gaps in our practice. And you put a, a, a little pathway in there, you know, for all the doctors, you educate the doctors, you signpost the doctors, tell them this is the national guidance for treating a UTI. And then after that, after a period of time, you re-audit that, uh, that, that, that management of UTI and the diagnosis. And you would expect an improvement, yes? And then you analyze the change and you look for better outcomes. That is closing an audit loop. Now, this process may take about a year, one year, two years. And in the United Kingdom, most of the junior doctors are expected to complete an audit loop and a quality improvement program. This is the simplest of examples I can give you, right? Now, most of you will wonder how will we, can we do that in a country like India or the Middle East? There are ways and means of doing it if you know how to do it. And then I talk about generic skills. This is my this is my pet pet project about generic skills and soft skills. So you have to be a good leader. You have to document well. You have to be a good team player. All of this gets reflected in your CV, and it should reflect in your CV, and that actually makes you quite different to the others. Now, one of the most important things I need to emphasize to most of you is people know that you got an MRCP. People know that you got an MMD. People know that you got uh, an MBBS. We don't want to know that. We need to know the extra skills that you have. And these are the extra skills that you have that's quite different in the United Kingdom compared to the others. And this is one of the most important things. Again, I've rarely seen in your, in your CV that you have teaching skills. So how do you go about showing your teaching skills? You teach in any setting, any, any program. It could be a seminar, it could be a workshop, it could be a, a Zoom meeting like this. Get feedback from people. Yeah, it could be a formal or informal feedback. And then you get evidence of the teaching you did. You get a report from a supervisor, get a report from the uh, organizing team. And that actually ticks your box for teaching skills. So you should be able to show that you're a good teacher. That's very, very important. Right? And the other one is leadership. How do we know that you're a good leader? So you can do by leading projects. When you lead a, a cardiac arrest call, you're a leader. When you lead a multidisciplinary team meeting, you're a leader. When you do a ward round, you're leading a ward round. So simple, simple things that is actually showing you leadership skills. You can for, go for leadership courses, and you can also teach in some of these courses. Some of this is mainly for, maybe you might mention this leadership is mainly for senior people, yes, but there are opportunities, and you'd be surprised to know how some of the people in the UK get onto the leadership ladder, yeah? So these are sort of fine skills that you need to do. Now, going back about publications, there's a whole talk about publications, and I'm not going to talk about it, but you can get simple case reports, you can do article submissions, and you know when you do a quality improvement program, this is what we actually come out with, a poster, yeah? So, no, so when you do a quality improvement project, what you do is you 
you do an audit, you do a quality print program, and you come out of the publication. So it's two birds with one, one stone, yes? Then you can do a clinical review article, uh, and you can do comments on articles, and you could do participate in higher level randomized control trials, which I don't think many of you will be involved in, but you could do case reports and you could do audits, yes? Again, there's going to be a detailed talk on that. The other thing a lot of people have scratched their head about once they're in the UK, what is research, what is audit, what is evaluation? Now, audit, as I already mentioned, is there is already a standard and you're checking if you're practicing according to the standard. A research is something that is done to produce that standard. Yeah, so you're testing a hypothesis and you're producing a standard. That's what research means in a nutshell. And what does evaluation mean? Evaluation means you're just evaluating what is it there in front of you. You're actually not following a standard. You don't have to follow a standard. So that's generally, I think these are these are the questions that gets asked in interviews. What's the difference between research and audit mostly? And people get confused a lot. All right, now, what's the importance of this clinical governance in interviews? You can see in most of the interviews, especially the specialty training programs, there is a separate station for clinical governance in addition to soft skills. And very little is tested about your knowledge. There's only one third of the interview process which tests your clinical knowledge. All the others about governance, clinical governance, how safe you are, and your communication skills. So you have to emphasize, and this has to be emphasized, that these things are very, very important in contrast to in India where you have your MD, where you have your, uh, your exams, and then you're the best doctor in town. Yes? Now, how do you make sure that you can actually participate in an audit? And this is why it's very, very important when you come to UK, get a clinical observership, or it's called as clinical attachments. During this period is this time when you can understand the systems, you can understand the guidelines and the protocols, you can improve your generic skills, you can also talk to a lot of people and find out what's going on. You get a chance to do an audit. Maybe the audit can be, there are different roles in an audit, which uh, Dr. Abzal will mention to you. It could be simple things like just for data collection. It could be simple things like creating a performer, but you've got to be very clear what you do in that. But an observership is the best way to actually, you know, climb up the ladder, sorry, enter in the ladder of uh, trying to do some audits uh, and clinical audits. Minute, so yeah. yeah. So in summary, the awareness of clinical governance is key to your medical CV in the UK. Having an audit of uh, or awareness of audit is essential. It's essential is not uh, like you know you may do it, but it's always essential. You've got to be clear of your roles in the audit and in the other work that you claim in your CV. You've got to be very, very clear what you actually do. So try to demonstrate all the key components, like I said, audit, governance, patient safety, uh, teaching, management, leadership, all these sort of things in your, 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 your workshops that you do. Most of you actually mention about the workshops and teaching that you do anyway, but try to incorporate all these key components and then do an observership if you can uh, to achieve these skills. Um, so, so that's my summary slide. And then we can say uh, that's, that's how you establish the link between clinical governance and, and audit. And I think, uh, uh, I hope I, you know, uh, it, it was a, a, a quick whistle stop tour um, to actually talk to you about clinical governance, which actually a, a major, major thing. I hope I've been able to convince you that clinical governance is, 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 is very, very important. So uh, many thanks for that. And I'm going to stop sharing my slides now. And it's time to hand it over to back to Dr. Rafiq. Thank you very much, Raf. That was an excellent overview. And we need to make it clear, given the time constraints, we can only give an overview. And that was an excellent overview. And it almost seems cruel to stop that talk there. But you covered most of the things that needed covering. So thank you very much for that, Riaz. So the next session is going to be on audit, on clinical audit. And I have great pleasure, in, sorry, great pleasure even in introducing Dr. Abzal Abubakar, who is a specialist trainee in pediatrics, who did his medicine from Calicut Medical in, in, in Kerala and has got a specialist interest in pediatric cardiology and neonatology. He was involved in many other organizations in the past and he's done a clinical fellowship in the past as well. Uh, so he's got a lot of experience in audit, which forms the backbone of the governance structure in the UK, as uh, Dr. Yaz mentioned. So I'll hand over to Dr. Abzal Abubakar. Uh, hi, good evening, one and all. Uh, thank you very much for your kind words, uh, Dr. Rafiq Paraka. So, uh, can you can you can you see my screen? Yes. yes okay. Yeah. Do you want to put it on slideshow, sir? Yeah. Sure. Perfect. Okay. So. Um, so I would like to speak about the uh, 
uh, the steps on how to do an audit with some practical tips as well. So uh, regarding clinical audit, uh, I hope you got a, a good idea from the previous talk. So you have a big definition from NICE, but in simple words, it is a quality improvement process uh, which we do in order to improve patient care overall. So what we are doing is that we are trying to analyze our current practice or system uh, against a set guideline or protocol. So basically, uh, we would analyze the data that we have collected, and then we are planning for uh, improvement by identifying uh, the areas of improvement. And after which we would be implementing those changes and then again repeating the whole process in the name of re-audit to analyze uh, how, it, how the changes that we have made uh, has affected the whole system. So again, the audit cycle, which has been previously uh, mentioned in the, in the previous talk. So uh, I would be just going through each of these steps. So the first step uh, is to identify the issue. So as a beginner, one of the easiest thing to do would be to join an already organized audit. Uh, the second thing would be uh, to set up an audit yourself for which you need to have a better understanding of the system of an audit. So uh, one of the primary issue is to identify uh, identify your topic. So you can identify from your own observation if you if you identify any areas of improvement in your own department, or you can approach your consultant or a senior doctor in your department regarding potential topics. and. Sometimes the, the audit department in your trust, especially if you are in the UK, can also help you identifying the potential issues. Now, if you're planning your own audit, uh, as mentioned, it's always best to select a topic which are focused on the processes like investigations, treatments, and procedures. Now, uh, the topic should be also something which you can audit against, like audit against a standard. It can be any local or a national target. Now, uh, it, when you are selecting a topic, uh, you should also try to ensure that the data is easily collectable. Uh, it's also important to register with the audit department, especially if you are in the UK. Now, you should, you should also think about uh, the potential for a re-audit when, uh, when, when you're selecting a topic, especially if there is a high turnover of, turnover of patients you're selecting, uh, you can easily re-audit in a few months' time. And, also, the other aspect that you need, you need to think about is how easy is it to change, uh, to uh, how easy to, is it to implement changes. The other thing is uh, the potential to present in meetings and conferences and the potential to pub, uh, for publications in the future, uh, which can add up into your CV. Uh, the last step in this, uh, in this section would be to form a team with your supervising consultant or uh, and with some of your colleagues if it's a big project. Now, just to share about my first audit experiences. Uh, so I had some difficulties in choosing the right topic initially because I was, uh, um, uh, I was interested to do an audit uh, myself rather than joining an audit. So within the time constraints, and um, it was quite, uh, quite tricky to find a suitable topic uh, with the right potential to implement quick changes as well. But uh, at last, I ended up identifying an issue with our departmental discharge summaries. And hence, I formulated an audit with the aim to compare the discharge summaries against the uh, guidelines given in our department, departmental guidelines book. So I, I, I selected a time period as well. Now, the second step is to obtain or define standards. As mentioned, it can be any local standard, departmental trust guidelines. It can be national or international standards as well, uh, like NICE guidelines or guidelines from the Royal Colleges. Now, uh, with regards to my experiences, so, uh, so I selected the guidelines from our clinical guidelines book, which men clearly mentioned uh, the topics that are required to be in your uh, discharge summary. So I was trying to uh, collect data based on this. So this step three, that is the data collection. So you can approach uh, the audit department, especially if, if you are in the UK, to help arranging the medical records of the patients uh, to get the uh, get all the patient notes. Or sometimes it's very easy if, if you have an online database and uh, a &E or GP notes as well. Now for data collection, it's important that uh, you have an Excel sheet or a Google form at least where you can put all the data that would make it easier for you to analyze the data later on. Now, uh, you need to identify your data size. So first you have to have a 
uh, inclusion criteria where uh, where that criteria would formulate all the um, all the data size that, that you need to collect the data from and and from there you might need to exclude as well so from my experiences um, the inclusion criteria that I uh, stated was uh, I tried to pull out all the discharge summaries within that six month period. And from those discharge summaries, I excluded the day case admissions, ward review admissions and other outlier uh, discharges from that uh, to have a better, uh, better review. And then I also uh, uh, formed an Excel sheet where I tried to uh, do the data collection on the Excel sheet uh, as as you can see in the screen. Now the step four is to analyze the data that you have done. So you have to analyze the data against the standards that you have uh, selected. So you have to establish which all standards are being met and which are not. This is one formula that would help you to, uh, to calculate the compliance percentage against the standard. So the uh, numerator is the number of patients who meets the standards. The, the denominator is the inclusion criteria minus the exclusion criteria, which is essentially your data size. Now, uh, from these compliances, uh, you need to identify where all uh, in the practice uh, you can uh, you can identify improvement or changes. The next uh, uh, slide here, it shows the overall uh, results uh, on analysis of my, of my first audit. So here you can see that the compliance of many areas were below 50 percentage. And hence, I, I was trying to identify what are the causes for it. So the step five, implement changes. So before this, you need to present or discuss these results with your team and department uh, in order to identify the changes which are required for improvement. And uh, at the end, you would, you would be formulating an action plan in order to implement those changes. In my audit, I formulated an action plan where I, was, uh, I had a formal discussion with my chief, uh, chief consultant doctor uh, in order to update our ward book guidelines to, uh, to guide the junior doctors, to, uh, to liaise with our online database professionals to in improve the format of the uh, discharge summary. And then re-audit itself is, what, is one of the action, uh, is, is one of the main, uh, main thing to be placed on your action plan. Now the step six, re-audit, which is essentially repeating the whole process again, but you need to wait for at least around four to six months time after implementing those changes. Uh, and all these steps would be repeated in order to reanalyze how the changes have helped the, your current system. Now doing these re-audit uh, at least three times would achieve maximum marks in most of your training applications. So hence, it is quite important to do re-audits. So my take home message would be, uh, would be that audits are quite important, especially to improve patient care. And it is also a great way to show your interest in a specialty. So uh, you can start with a simple audit to understand the whole process. And you can also always try to re-audit in order to gain extra CV points. Later on, you can maximize your skills and efforts thereafter, looking forward for presentations and publications. Now, one main thing that people used to ask is that whether they can do an audit outside the UK. Yes is the answer, but, um, but you need to be a bit more smarter. You need to discuss with a senior consultant regarding what all potential topics you can, uh, you can do on. Uh, the other thing is that um, you need to select a topic where you can compare to a set guideline, which is followed in your department. Now, some of the examples uh, that I thought would be that, uh, I'm sure that there would be septic shock guidelines in the what immediate the management. Yeah, uh, so, uh, so uh, I'm sure that you would be aware about the septic shock guidelines, uh, the door to, door to balloon time for angioplasty, ventilator care bundle used in ICUs. So these are some potential topics that you can uh, select and, uh, and audit on your current management against your, uh, against your guidelines. And uh, the other thing is that documentation uh, is one area that uh, some of the departments would be struggling to emphasize. So uh, that's one thing that you can audit on. So you just need to uh, identify these areas along with support from a senior consultant in your own department now and then it's essential to present it within your department and try to make changes and if possible doing a re-audit would be great as well so that's all from my talk 
Thank you very much for that. Thank you very much, Abdul. That was a, a great insight into audit. And you, you close it at the end as well by saying how you convert an audit into a quality improvement project, where by doing the audit, you identified the problem, and then you're making some suggestions to improve or work or rectify that problem, and then re-auditing. And that is what quality improvement programs are about. It's not just about auditing to get a publication alone, but actually it benefits the, the department and the patient as well, where you then suggest some changes and then when you re-audit, you can see the changes you've made, how they've effectively improved the system. So that basically is the quality improvement program. So that's the link between audit and quality improvement. Thank you very much for that, Abdul. Um, so I'll move on to the next talk. Again, like we said, we've got questions and an answer session in the end. And all the questions, we are trying to answer questions as we go along on the chat. So have a look out for that. But otherwise, we will answer as many questions as we can at the end. So. And the next speaker is, is a good friend of mine, and it's a great honor and pleasure to introduce Dr. Biju Mohammed, who works as a consultant physician and geriatrician at the University of Wales Hospital. He is again a multidisciplinary movement disorder service lead. He is regularly invited to speak at um, various conferences um, nationally and internationally. He's a chair of various organizations uh, in, in, in Wales and beyond. Um, so without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Biju Mohammed, who's going to speak to us on how to get publications. Biju. Thank you very much, uh, Rafika. I'm just going to share my screen. I trust you can see my screen now. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction, Rafika. And uh, thank you to uh, Cam Priyas and Siji for the invite. So I'm going to talk about um, getting publications. And uh, whilst when you start off uh, new, um, you know, having just finished your medical school and then thinking about a job, getting a publication may not be at the top of your agenda. But a lot of the things that Afsal has spoken about and other speakers have spoken about has the potential to culminate in publications. Um, so I have two acknowledgements to make. The first is that I'm a full-time NHS clinician and I'm not a clinical academic. So my talk is very much coming from a point of view of, uh, of a clinical, uh, full-time clinical person rather than an academic. And the second thing is what I'm going to say is not something that I have formally learned, but something that I've gathered over the last 20 years of my clinical experience in the NHS. So the next eight or nine minutes is going to be spent on A, answering the question, why should you publish? What should you publish? Where should you publish? How can you publish? And then some examples on how your CV would look with publications. And finally, some tips. So the reason to publish is that A, it's, it improves your knowledge. Whenever you have to publish on a topic, you have to read up a lot about it and you have to be an expert in your field. It gives you recognition among your peers. You get a lot of exposure. You start meeting peers who have got an interest in that field and it exponentially improves your knowledge. And most importantly, from your point of view at this point, you know, it improves your job chances. So when we look at CVs, I look at hundreds of CVs every year and they all look the same. And sometimes you're trying to see what is different from CV A to CV B. And if I see somebody who's done a good quality audit work or who has got even a line of publication in the CV, I think, okay, actually this person has done a little bit additional work. Let me look into the CV a little bit more. And finally, and the most important work is from a professional point of view, it's a culmination of work. I mean, there is a saying in the medical field that if you start doing a piece of work, you know, you've got to complete it. And if you complete it, you've got to publish it. There's no point starting off an audit, presenting in your clinical department and just leaving it there. Because if that audit has the opportunity to turn it into a publication that you can present nationally or internationally, then there's no reason you shouldn't do it. So what sort of things can you publish? So I've just gone from the easiest to the hardest. So the first one that I've got is, you know, simple things. You, you read lots of journals, you have letters and things like that. You can respond to articles. That's quite easy to do. And that, that is a line in your CV. Then you move on to the clinical case reports. Um, and these are there everywhere. Uh, we can talk about that in a minute. Poster publications, you can also do review articles. And uh, then it gets a little bit harder when you have to do a literature review. And finally, clinical trials. So this is going into uh, how to publish where and how. So the first thing to do is to choose a topic. So that can be anything. And so when you do a clinical ward round, you know, you may see somebody who's got say heart failure and who has got hyperkalemia due to some other problems. That might be a simple clinical problem, but actually there may be some other aspects of it that you can actually turn it into a very interesting case report if they've got some other abnormalities that is generalizable, 
then you should think about writing it up. And even simple cases, they don't have to be the most rarest of cases. You have to know where to publish those cases. And that comes down to you reading up about uh, the sort of cases that will be accepted. For example, if you're thinking about doing a, a case report, you know, where would they be accepted? What sort of journals will take them? Uh, does the journal look for a much higher pedigree of publication? The reputation of the journal is important, but if you're starting off, you shouldn't be thinking of journals with higher reputation. For example, we know that things like the Lancet New England Journal of Medicine have very high impact factors, whereas other journals have lower impact factors. You would start off with journals that accept these sort of publications. The key thing is writing up, and that requires a lot of input. And that is the one thing that stops people from public, public, publishing things. So when you start writing up, there's a lot of things to look into. You have to look at the grammar. You have to look at how you write up. There is a certain method of writing up, whether it's a case history, whether it's a journal article, etc. So read up lots of different uh, types of articles and journals, and then you'll get an idea on how, how it's written. And then once you've written it up, then you would show it to a peer either a senior colleague, or you would show it to your consultant who would then go through it and correct and support you in doing that process. And then there's a revision process we'll come to in a minute. So on the right side of the screen, you can see this was an invite that was sent for me to, to look at an article that was recently written up by somebody. And I've highlighted the bits there that you can see. It's a generalist journal, this one. The idea of the journal is to keep physicians up to date and the target audience. So these are the sort of things you should look when you're sending it to a particular journal. Uh, I mentioned briefly about response and revision. So once you write an article, it doesn't mean, and you send it to a journal, it doesn't mean that's the end of the process. There will then be a revision process. They'll write back to you saying, I don't like the tone of this, or you haven't justified, your tables don't make sense, or your images don't marry up with your tables, so on and so forth. And they'll give you lots and lots of feedback, which would be what I would do with the previous letter, for example. And then you have to correct it. You have to send two or three revisions. And sometimes the process can take a few months, but a lot of the times, it depends on individual journals. So I'm just moving on to some examples. So this is a case report that uh, we did a couple of years ago. And this was a fairly straightforward uh, case. You know, somebody had some eye drops, they had anticholinergic effects, and they became extremely agitated and developed psychosis. This in itself isn't a very rare thing. But having said that, we put the things together. We wrote a very nice article, and it was uh, we were able to publish it. So this was just making the point that you don't need very complicated or the rarest of rare cases to, to highlight something, because people do want to know uh, common things that will change their clinical practice or things that need to be reminded as well. Uh, Riaz very briefly mentioned about doing posters, and um, Afsal mentioned about doing an audit. So as I said, whenever you do a piece of work, or a unit, you, know, you have to make sure that you can try and get it as far as it'll go. So this was an audit that we did in our day hospital uh, here locally in South Wales. We looked at the number of patients that were coming into our day hospital. What sort of therapies were they having? What was the outcome of it? So that was an audit in that sense. But we then went ahead, we wrote it up and we sent it off to an international conference. They accepted it and we were able to do a poster. And that poster has resulted in a line in our CVs. And so that adds up to the uh, lines of publication. And this wasn't very difficult to do. So there's always ways to, to do these sort of things. And the important thing is if you ever go for a conference, there are a lot of conferences or most conferences except post to publications and never go for a conference if you don't take something with you to present. This is a literature review in progress. So a literature review is slightly more complicated. You have to go through the, you have to have your question phrased properly. Then you have to go through your entire literature and there's methodologies for doing that. Um, and so this was done by a second year medical student in conjunction with me. And again, this has taken him about two or three weeks of work, but it's come out as a very good article and we are in the process of publishing this. So it's just important to remember that once you get the methodology correct, then the process of it is just the writing up and just keeping on with trying to get it published in different uh, journals. This is going up a notch higher now. We're talking about journal articles. This has taken a bit of work with me and three other colleagues where we've looked at the burden of siluria in uh, Parkinson's, and then we have written up a very thorough review article. Um, again, this took a few more months and you have to see which articles will take this. So we send this to the advanced neurological disorder articles and it's been, it's been published. So, so this would take a lot more effort, but um, it's not out of scope uh, with, with the right sort of support. And one of the things that I mentioned very uh, early on was uh, making sure that uh, when you write up, you need to use the right language, the right grammar, the right 
phrasing. And one of the most important thing is referencing. Uh, there's two broad referencing systems that are used, which is the Harvard and the Vancouver system. Um, and it's important that you understand this because if you do not reference the things that you're putting out in your publication, that's caused as plagiarism. And I'd be more than happy to pass on an article uh, about the referencing system, which we can forward on if needed. I'm just giving an example, finally, my last couple of slides in terms of how your CV would look. So I've used my, say, my own CV as an example, and I've split this into different aspects. So if you are getting grants, for example, if you're involved in clinical trials, uh, you put them across. And then I've put this area on health and clinical research. So you can split them into different aspects. But for the main, it's looking at publications, abstracts, and letters. So um, again, it's about the referencing. You put it in the right order. Uh, you do your most latest, and then you come backwards. And this is just going into things that I've done as a, as a medical student as well. And finally, looking at some of the review articles. So once you're in the process of doing it, it's important to keep a record. Uh, some tips and my final conclusion slide. So I. I over the last 10 minutes, I've been trying to give you an overview of uh, how to publish, where to publish, and why to publish. So, so the first and key thing is if you start a piece of work, whether it be an audit, a quality improvement project, your aim should be to try and culminate that in a publication. Always be on the lookout. Like I said, your clinical ward rounds, your clinics, everywhere. There are There is something that you can tweak and change and write up and read a little bit more about that could potentially become a case report, an interesting image, or even a quality improvement that could become a poster in an international conference. Uh, that's the what and where. The how is, and, and that's the most key thing. You've got to find a willing senior, somebody who's got a record of publication, somebody who's familiar with how to write up and somebody who's happy to spend a bit of time for you doing the hard work. And once you've got the right person, getting the publication is, is a far easier job. Practicing writing, and I can't stress enough of that because that is the key thing. Once you get into the, and it takes a long time. I mean, it took me about five or seven years to, to get into the, the way of writing in terms of what a journal will accept. Uh, but once you start doing it, it does keep getting easier and you will get the energy to keep submitting because you do get quite a lot back in terms of uh, having those lines in your CV. And I think that's my final slide. I'll be happy to take any questions in the Q&A. Thank you very much, Rafika. I'm going to stop sharing. That was, a, that was an excellent um, overview on, on publications. Um, two key takeaways that I got from there. The first thing was almost the first sentence that Dr. Vijay said was that he's not an academic, he's a jobbing everyday clinician like everybody else. So the takeaway message from that is that you need not be a high flying professor in any university to publication. Everybody should be publishing. And Biju is not far away from being a high flying professor, but in spite of that, he started publishing many years ago. So an everyday jobbing clinician should be able to publish. The second bit is, is not about bench research or, or basic science and not everybody is aiming to publish in, in biology cell or nature, that your audit publications, your poster presentation, you start somewhere and your, some of the best presentations I've seen or publications I've seen is from medical students. So it doesn't have to be. So everybody can have a go at doing publications. And I think what we're trying to do is to demystify publications so that everybody is able to do that. Okay, having said that, uh, the final formal talk of the evening before we move to Q&A is Dr. Siddhi Kulakal. Again, he's a well-known personality on the Zoom circuit nowadays. He's, um, he's been, again, one of the founder members of um, um, Camp and Excel and has been involved with CG for many, many years. Um, he's one of our senior consultants in the UK and is a mentor for many, many people. His uh, day job is a consultant respiratory physician and lead in sleep medicine particularly, and is a honorary lecturer and academic advisor at the medical school in Manchester. And he also does a lot of social work on the side and is currently chairman of UPHAR, which is a, a stem cell and organ donor registry, which is trying to encourage South Asians um, to register themselves as um, stem cell and organ donors. So Dr. Siddiq Polakal, and he will be talking on tips and tricks of um, CV. So he'll sort of summarize and uh, the whole session that we've had so far to a certain extent. Siddiq. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rafi. Can, can all of you hear me? Yeah, we can, Siddiq, yeah. yeah, yeah. My screen visible, yeah? Yes, it My is. Screen visible? Yes, yes, it is. 
Okay. Right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rafiq. Now, uh, I think uh, we are having an excellent uh, session now. The uh, last uh, topic I was supposed to talk about is uh, some few tips. So what I thought is uh, uh, probably we can just merge it with a, a QA session where, uh, so what, what happened so far is uh, Dr. Uh, Rafiq gave you an idea of what a CV looks like, what all things to be in the CV, how to put it. And then Dr. Uh, Riaz, Biju, and Afsal gave you an idea how to fill it on. Now, uh, obviously, I think the most important question what we get from, especially from uh, you know, doctors from India is, uh, now uh, we don't have an audit department to do an audit. We don't have any support or we don't have a medical records to get the notes or uh, you know, to do research. We don't have a, many much of support. But actually the fact is, it is not what exactly what we, uh, you know, what support or what we do, it is the, uh, you know, the, the process. So for example, like uh, to be a teacher, you don't have to be a professor, even if you are doing a teaching symbol, like your medical students, if you are a final year student, if you're second year, it can be an activity, leadership. You don't have to be a medical director or a clinical director to say that you're leadership, even a, as Rias mentioned, you'd be a class rep, you know, that can be a leadership role. Uh, similarly, uh, audit, you don't have to do kind of a big complex ideas, even, because sometimes what we say is, uh, I work in a small hospital, maybe a, in a small uh, clinic, hospital, there is not much support. Yes, whatever you do there, you can generate an idea uh, to do an audit, uh, which is uh, as long as you understand the process. So that is the uh, most uh, important. Similarly for publication, maybe a bit difficult, but even a presentation, if you're able to do a presentation in one of your uh, maybe local uh, you know, IMA meetings or whatever, that's all kind of uh, accounts. You don't have to look for, uh, you know, major representation in the international journal. So I think uh, the, the the idea, you understood what the idea, what is important, that's more, uh, you know, relevant. So just uh, what I do is I maybe just uh, give you a, a few slides, which I don't have uh, many slides, something which we just picked up from the CVs, what you have sent, and then I just uh, merge it with our QA session. Now, this may be document, Type this. It is obviously now everything is digital. You know we uh, don't do much of a paper. So this is my uh, folder. You can see what all things are there. This is somebody's CV. CV is file name is Nunu. Someone else is medical CV, curriculum vitae. Uh, you know CV JBS. So this we have to be very careful about. That. We have to give a good subject uh, the uh, file name. You have to put your name. Say for example like. Uh, if you look at here, Dr. Jasmith, Perumbalatha, CV, July 2020. That's an excellent uh, kind of uh, you know subject heading for that her uh, CV document. Again, you can see the Dr. Rafiq presentation. She put it as uh, Dr. Rafiq. What is makes a good CV? July 2020. So this is not really relevant for your uh, uh, CV, but for any digital document, what you make, make sure that you have a good uh, file name. Go. This will go to different places. People will not have a time to. Kind of search through again a document type so you can see that some cvs are uh, uh, pdf some of them are word document always the final cv better to send it as a, a pdf because the uh, word document can change when it is open to different kind of devices maybe a, even the consultant might open it on a, a word uh, ipad or maybe a phone so make sure you know you send your cv as a, a pdf document uh, the final one. Of course, you have to keep as a, a Word document backup so that you can make all the changes. Again, this is another, uh, again, which is quite interesting, which I always uh, uh, very much get annoyed when we get uh, email from, uh, uh, not only from uh, junior doctors, even from colleagues and different matters. They don't have a subject heading, sir, thank you, or no, at, nothing at all. Or there may be an email which has been something else that you reply it without changing the heading, but totally a different subject. So again, you can see here, uh, this is something uh, Muhammad Shahi sent me an email, but there is no subject heading. Of course, there is something uh, important is there. So this again, you have to make sure when you are getting an email to a CV or even for matter, any kind of request, you make sure you put the attend, uh, right uh, subject heading. So for example, if you're sending a CV uh, to a kind of uh, a consultant, it will go to often to the secretaries, or there may be a, that the secretary may be looking at so many consultants, or it might go to this kind of a common pool. So if you are looking at to see this CV, your email to get to Dr. Johnson, you say, attention, Dr. Johnson, then obviously, you know, easily that get there. 
And similarly, if you are asking for a clinical attachment, make sure it is very you know, clear in the initial itself, clinical attachment request. It will get where uh, you know it should go. The next one is, uh, again, so what are the subject you, is uh, you make sure you uh, put that into your subject heading so that you know it won't get lost. So you request a meeting with Dr. Johnson for maybe a career advice or maybe a, you know, a clinical touch and whatever it is. Now, uh, I just uh, give you a, a couple of things on the career statement, which uh, uh, Dr. Rafiq already touched upon. So I'm just giving you a simple example, which I, you know, you, all of you, quite a few of you send us some slides, so, sorry, your CVs. So this is a career statement from one of the CVs we got. And this is another one. So career objective has to be, for, one is uh, for the context, has to be as simple as it is. Don't have to make, uh, you know, a lot of cliche words and no, that doesn't make anything at all. Does it, you don't need to put all these things. Actually, uh, that can be a distraction uh, rather than a kind of, uh, and I'll show you another, uh, see, this is another career statement. Uh, I'm currently working as a foundation to your doctor. I have completed four hospital rotation, which I held or response, whatever. And then my GP rotation extremely useful because he is slowly, you know, pushing towards that. Now he wants to become a GP, and uh, I'm interested in either pursuing career in general medicine, general practice. So it's very clear what you are applying for this job, what is his objectives are. Very simple, very clear. Anybody could understand. So you don't have to when you are applying for uh, what are the job. You make it very clear what exactly your objective is, rather than just going around this uh, in a cliche statement. Again, uh, uh, the context has to be specific to the job. Uh, so obviously, you know, uh, so for example, if you're giving a, a CV to a kind of UK job, if you use, this is a CV of somebody uh, just in a one year or two year of uh, 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 general uh, you know, practice after MBBS. And it's a competent general practitioner in UK means somebody who is already qualified. That particular word doesn't say anything for that uh, person. So you have to make sure your CV is to the, uh, the context, what, you are, what job you're looking for, what job you're applying for, uh, to make sure it is uh, you know, relevant. And of course, uh, again, uh, Dr. Rafiq mentioned about this uh, uh, style and uh, proofreading. So if you look at here, I mean, you can see that uh, held in view of world breast feeding. So make sure you know you Proofread. These are all the actual ones we received in the last, uh, you know, few days. Again, uh, in a style, uh, I think they all mentioned about the cells. So for example, like a poster presentation at national conference. Again, this need to kind of, uh, you know, put it, uh, you know, properly. If you can say that, uh, what is the topic, and where was it done? How was it done? Rather than just kind of, uh, you know, mixing and so the reader can get an immediate view. Chronological order. Again, this is a part of the CV what we received today can see all kind of jumped up something uh, 2014 and then 15 and then going back to 15. And again, this is very important. Uh, now, this is a CV uh, of uh, someone who has just finished a houseman's job or house agency going maybe for the first or second job. Look at that, how crowded it is. So, but nothing is, uh, everything is relevant, I'm supposed. But I don't think a consultant who has a one minute to read a whole CV is going to, you know, rubble through all these and to find out what exactly it is. So make sure this is, a, you know, bullet points. Now look at that same thing, like exactly the person what is done, bullet points. What is he done? Doctor, for postings, what exactly doctor with on-call response, each one, the main response is given. So get a very quick idea that, okay, this doctor has done a kind of a four or five postings within a year time or two years time and gone through, a, you know, different key uh, responsibilities or essential skills, what they learned. Again, uh, this again, I think uh, Dr. Rafiq did mention about the, uh, the reference. Now, a few things about the reference. One is uh, an email, which Dr. Rafiq already mentioned, but also uh, uh, how many reference? Four reference. Here, how many are there? Six reference. You don't need to have this many references. We just need a, a two, maximum three, and the recent reference always should be there if at all possible. And uh, if you look at this referral, it's quite a good one. Now, if possible, always include the, uh, the credentials. So for example, like a child legal, if it is a MS, a master FRCS, FRCP, it is always good to do that. So make it complete. And again, uh, uh, to make sure the address is complete and that email is there. Num telephone number, probably not uh, necessary, but if it is there, it's okay. 
and uh, yeah so these two reference you know quite good probably this could go into the first line if uh, you know the space permits uh, i think uh, it's all this relevant information i think uh, still we have a habit of putting it we don't need to and uh, again uh, the facts uh, dr rafi did mention that uh, you know putting the facts uh, so i'm just giving you uh, some of the examples what we received uh, you know live in the last uh, you know few days so that you can relate you know what uh, we are talking about is it's actually you know it is happening now a uh, training okay this is good he's put all his training he's put all the uh, you know expansions bls because some of the time when what we have it in india the the abbreviations may not be relevant at all here maybe a easy uh, uh, bls basic life support so i think make sure you put all that uh, expansion in you know, all the uh, uh, you know where you explain and then highlights what is it just ways see preventive care expert call it excellent excellent listener effective communication this doesn't say anything probably it can act as a kind of uh, you know maybe a negative because if someone start writing like this will not have much information about that uh, candidate Uh, declaration uh, probably again this is not something uh, relevant uh, over qualification this is something which uh, you know uh, we can be a, again a negative factor for us because most of uh, indian doctors even though they are uh, you know coming to here maybe i have to start at a fi or maybe a very a junior job but they would have done uh, you know quite a bit maybe uh, you know before they come here uh, maybe they're on a post graduation they done three four years of experience so actually this happens to me when i came here after nmd and i was asking looking for the first job i was okay with any job but when wherever i go i have been get rejected oh no no sidik how can we give you this will be an insult to you but i just need a job i just need to start so make sure you know all these kind of too much of experience don't uh, you know put it you don't have to lie but you have to uh, all the time order you have to put a timeline everything what you have done but just trying to kind of uh, depends on the job uh, try to underplate and putting a lot of details there hobbies uh, again this is uh, uh, dr rafiq mentioned i think i don't need to you know go into that uh, reading computer traveling photography swimming sports table tennis cricket volleyball again if uh, if you know the uh, interviewer is a kind of a cricket fan probably you can put cricket and ready to answer some questions so now uh, i think uh, i just uh, gave you a, a quick idea uh, what in reality is happening from all the talk uh, especially dr rafi given now we will move on to a, in a qa session so what we in qa session what we will do is we will we have an expert panel here all our speakers and then uh, dr uh, uh, fahiz mohammed so we will uh, go through a few uh, cvs and then also we will uh, try to answer all the questions uh, uh, you have uh, you know put through the uh, uh, chat box and the last uh, if anybody raise your hand we can uh, you know directly we can ask your questions and we will uh, go through that now to help me here with the qa session we have uh, a siad a siad is a, a it specialist but also you know important uh, person in our uh, camp and excel uk and he himself uh, Uh, does a lot of uh, you know training activities uh, he uh, very much involved in we do another session another uh, you know series for the uh, you know technic uh, technology technology related it related so he is uh, leading that uh, and uh, dr rubas sorry not dr rubas uh, mr rubas kuti let it be like that sidika <laughs> uh, he is an engineer by profession but uh, he is uh, anything but in Uh, in a civil engineer he is a project manager and is again uh, in a backbone of our activities he does all these uh, you know logistical support everything for every program and uh, he's been a you know big helping hand for all our activities so he will be uh, both of them will be helping us in this uh, uh, qa session now is uh, dr uh, uh, fahiz uh, here is he available or yeah, can yeah, i can see him in the in the list so if you can unmute him i'm going to unmute him now okay Yeah, he's unmuted now. Yeah, he's he's. he's yeah, good. I'm I'm here now. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, yeah, good. Yes, Dr. Fahiz. Uh, uh, Dr. Fahiz is a a surgeon, a general surgeon. Uh, he's a, a senior surgeon. He's also uh, working in the uh, south, that is the Wessex Wessex area, and uh, uh, he's also the clinical director for the uh, surgery, and he has a special interest in peritoneal uh, uh, malignancy. The uh, is it the uh, pseudo mixer tumor and he's the national uh, you know lead for that now he as a, a consultant and a clinical director he of course he is involved in a lot of uh, you know training and teaching he must be seeing uh, maybe hundreds of 
CVs for all level, maybe starting with the house of his uh, consultants, maybe, uh, you know, senior consultants uh, all the time. And he's an FRC as uh, examiner. So I think uh, he's a very good person for us to give a, an idea about how uh, especially a surgical CV uh, looks like, because I'm sure a few of our uh, participants are uh, from the uh, in a surgical field. So uh, uh, for his, could you just uh, talk to quickly about what a kind of a specifically what a surgical uh, CV looks like or what you'll be looking for uh, specifically in a surgical CV? So he's. Hello, yeah. can you hear me? Yes, yes, please. Yeah, yeah, so, so I think a lot of what's already been said in the, the excellent talks that we've just heard apply to, um, to surgical trainees as well. So I think that there's an, that there isn't really, there's an assumption I think that um, if, you're, if you're gonna be a good surgeon that you need to have done hundreds of operations uh, and, uh, and, and kind of um, display that in your CV, but actually all the principles that we've heard from all the talk, from all the speakers this afternoon, um, will apply. So I think um, you um, you need to be clear in what you uh, have achieved. I think showing a commitment to your speciality, uh, the easiest way to do that is with audits and publications, publications, presentations, uh, and research. And so it's it highlighting those shows a commitment to your speciality. And I think as a number of speakers have said, that's what's going to differentiate you from everyone else. You have to remember that many of us who shortlist are seeing, you know, 10, 20, 30 CVs. Um, and so it, you, in order to stand out, you need to so, you have something, uh, something different to distinguish yourself. And that's why it's important to, um, to, to focus on that and to use that as a, as a way to differentiate yourself. It's, it is, if de depending on your seniority, there's an understanding or an acceptance that you will have achieved a certain level of competence uh, from a clinical point of view. And so I think, um, you know, if, for instance, if someone has coming from India, they've done an MS, then you know that they will have a, a, a particular uh, skill set and level of competence. So you don't really need to focus too much on, on the number of operations that you've done. You just need to very briefly state what you've done in, in some form of in a table. Uh, it's useful to keep a logbook um, as many uh, UK trainees will will have to have a logbook and they'll be they'll have a portfolio. Um, but you, I think it's it's important that you um, don't don't dwell too much on that. But I, I would say, again, from a surgical point of view, what we're looking for is a commitment to the speciality. And that's best um, evidenced by. Uh, audit publications and presentations. Right. Okay. Thank you uh, for just uh, if you stay there. Can I just uh, show you one uh, CV uh, or a kind of uh, a surgical oriented CV? If you can just give a quick feedback uh, on that CV, is that, are you able to see the screen? There is a CV on the screen. Are you able to see that? Uh, are you are you're muted, Fahiz. Can you just unmute? Uh, Sorry, yeah. Uh, for his, are you able to see the uh, a screen? Uh, just a sec. Yeah, I can see the screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so if, you, if this is a CV once uh, we received, uh, you know, when we announced this program. So if you could just kind of, uh, you know, quickly give you a kind of a one minute feedback on the CV. Sure, so, so just to start with, it's a controversial area, whether you put a photograph of yourself or not. And I think some people, um, some people will, will think it's a good idea, but for, for other people, maybe not. And if you're applying an NHS jobs, for instance, there are, um, that, that when we see applications for jobs, we don't have any details. Often you don't even have the name of the, of the candidate. So you just need to be careful about putting a photograph of yourself and think, why am I putting this photograph here? Uh, and what does it add to my application? It, it's a personal thing. It's quite fashionable now in other fields to have a photograph there, but just think about it carefully. The other thing is we've talked about demographics and details. If you put your date of birth, your mobile phone number, your address, that's enough for anyone who, get, who sees that information 
to open up a bank account in your uh, identity. Uh, so you have to be careful. You don't need your date of birth. You don't need a lot of that information because that's highly sensitive, actually. The, the personal statement, it's good to have a personal statement tailored to the job you're applying for. But again, we've heard, you know, of course, everyone is highly motivated. Everyone has wants to do the best in their profession. A lot of this is just um, it's 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 unnecessary. And what it does is more importantly, it detracts from the important things, which in, you'll see in the rest of this CV. You know, if you have a strong academic record, if you've published papers, you have to look harder for all of that in amongst all of this. This is all kind of waffle. It's fluffy. You don't. And it's not it, it's not um, it's not actually relevant. So you need to you, we've, we've seen some very good examples in the talks that we've had this afternoon of how you can uh, get rid of all of that extra extra stuff and just focus on what's absolutely vital. So if we go on to the, um, you know, for, for me, when when I'm shortlisting again, if you have you're looking for things, what's what's that person's training? Where have they trained? What's their current post? Just a very brief uh, idea of what they've done from a surgical point of view. And then what I'm looking for really is their uh, awards that they've won, any awards and prizes, which will, dis will distinguish them from other people. I'm looking for their publications, peer reviewed publications. I'm looking for their poster presentations. And again, the way that you present this is important. So put the title of the presentation, put the list of the authors, were you first author, were you senior author, were you in the middle somewhere, and then put where you presented it. So you can see here that there's a poster presentation, Sixth World Glaucoma Congress in Melbourne, Australia. You've got the title. I actually want the title first, then you want a list of the authors, and then you want where it was presented. The other thing to be, uh, it's just a, a kind of a style thing. If Be careful in terms of whether you're putting high, whether you're highlighting, whether you're underlining, don't do everything. So either highlight in bold or underline or use italics, but don't, don't do all of those because it just becomes very difficult to pick out the information. And you can see here that um, this, uh, the, the, the applicant has a very strong CV, um, but a lot of it is lost because they haven't focused on, on their strengths. The real currency here is their publications and the fact that they have, um, uh, that they've won a number of awards. And I think with extracurricular activities and hobbies, my own personal view is unless you play cricket for India or unless you play football for your country, then, you know, you need to be very um, discriminatory, discriminating in what you put on there. Because, you know, I like to eat, but I wouldn't put it in my CV. And you may like to listen to music. You may like to play uh, to, to play sports. But actually, what does that add to, um, uh, to your ability to do the job. Um, so I, I like the way the CV is set out. There's nice headlines, uh, nice titles. There's some, uh, some color there. Um, but again, I, what I would say is you can strip out a lot of the uh, superfluous uh, um, kind of um, uh, the, 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 the paragraphs, descriptors, and you can just focus on, on the hard facts and the currency, which is the publications, the awards, the prizes. Excellent. Thank you for writing. Uh, that's an excellent review. Uh, this this is a, an excellent CV, actually. If a consultant has a one minute to look at the CV, and if you look at the one of us two pages, it might go into the bid without seeing the actual, uh, you know, what, uh, you know, awards and what exactly, you know, how good this candidate is. That is, I think, uh, as uh, Fahid said, you know, the principle what we all the you know, speakers giving you, if you follow that principle, uh, I think this is an excellent CV. It's uh, excellent. I agree. It's a fantastic CV. Excellent. Yeah, just to kind of uh, you know put it slightly differently so that the, uh, the attention is uh, you know the due attention is uh, you know given. Now, uh, uh, Dr. Rafiq. Yep. Can I just uh, show you a CV to see whether uh, what you think about this? Um, Are you able to see my screen or? Uh... Yeah, yeah, it's just opening up at the moment, isn't it? Yeah. 
uh, yeah is it uh, very colorful cv is that one yeah we are seeing it's this opened up as yet uh, riyas it's uh, uh, sorry sidik it's still opening up for us is it it's I think there's something, some of a delay there. I think there's a, I think there's a word document. There's something wrong. No, that's a PDF, right? It's a PDF, is it? Yeah, it's a PDF. It's, uh, I think now it's maybe a. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Now it is. Are you able to see that now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Right. I'll just reduce the size a little bit. Maybe easy for us to go through. Yeah, yeah. Maybe. Okay. Easy. Fine. okay. So. Um, thanks, Sirik. It's a good one. How not to do a CV for a medical post? Okay, so I think this is going to be honest feedback because I think if a second year medical student wants feedback, then I think we need to be honest and take back because they've got a few years to improve their CV. They're not applying for any medical post at the moment. So I'm going to be slightly critical in the CV to show how not to do a CV. So if you look at uh, people in medicine now, they don't come to work in jeans, they don't wear t-shirts to work, and they write CVs in plain old boring ways, but that captures the eye with the date, with the facts, and not with the, with the, with the bluster that goes around. So this is more about style rather than substance. Um, so you've got multiple colors here, you've got multiple things. I have no idea where I'm looking to see who this person is, where they've studied, they've got bits of education in one area, post in another area, membership in another area. But if you go back to a slightly more basic level here, one of the first things you should do when you do a CV is do a spell check. You know, So just simple things like if you look at presentation and conference, you don't spell conference with an A there. So you know, simple, just, just, just say for it, it leaps out at you when you do something like that. So, and the, the other thing is, um, I can't make out what this person is. I mean, I know they're currently doing medicine because um, it says they've joined MBBS only in 2018. But there are a number of things here that they've done that can be written in a way. And I think because like, like everybody said today, you know, if I, especially at um, house officer level or uh, if you're applying for your first job, usually these jobs, there might be about 50, 60 applicants for it. Um, and if you then get a, a CVs which follow a certain structure, and you suddenly get thrown in like this. Yes, people might look at it because it looks so rare. And if I, if this person is applying for a job in social media, then yes, I can understand that. But if you're applying for a medical job, I think this is the wrong way to address it. And I think there is some merit in going back to the original structure that we talked about, about putting things in a particular order. Yes, they've attended a few conferences. They've done a few things. And I think this, this again, coming back to this, the the substance of what this person has done, they've done quite a bit for somebody who's uh, in the second year of medical school. But the way they've laid it out, I lost interest um, straight away, you know, because I just didn't know where I was looking at, what I was looking at. I'd need a highlighter myself to go through every individual one to work out what it is that I was looking for. So late, what you need to think about, I mean, again, if you look at organized, you don't spell organized that way, you do it, you know, there's, there's a thing there. So what you need to think about when you're doing a CV, or when you write an email, like Sadiq said at the beginning is, how does it come across to the person reading it? So the person reading it, you're doing your CV to get yourself shortlisted. So you need to sit in the other person's chair and say, if I was reading the CV, does this make sense to me? Can I make any sense of it? No, you can't. So I think the simple, simplest thing is, I mean, if you're applying for a medical job, stick to the same boring routine where you list your name, you list your career objectives, you list your education, list, you list your award, you know, do it in a particular order um, and sometimes what happens is I've noticed a couple of other CVs that have come from India as well. I think some of these, they're either lifting it out of templates that are already available on the internet or they're giving it to private companies. And the risk with private companies is that I've seen CVs with exactly the same thing for two different candidates because they've actually made an error and the person submitting the CV hasn't proofread it. So make sure you do that. So I would start, if like, like the Irish would say, I would, if I were presenting the CV, I wouldn't start from here. I would take all this data, um, write it in a master CV, and then pick bits out under the various headings that we all of us have presented and do it that way. Okay, thank, thank you, Dr. Afrika. I, I think I, I agree with you if you look at this person from this uh, CV. But otherwise, uh, what I would say is uh, being a second year uh, medical student, just uh, you know, keep the CV, you know, how she put it on. I think she's an excellent, uh, you know, person. she's an excellent leader. She's going Absolutely. to be, a, I think she's going to be a, an asset. I think she will do really well because uh, if you look at what the stuff is in it, it is really amazing stuff. 
Uh, but of course, I think uh, this CV probably didn't do for a, a job requirement. Uh, so yeah. from the pure from the CV, uh, you know, analysis point of view, I agree with all. But otherwise, uh, uh, she's uh, you know she's an asset. She's an asset. Really? Thank yeah. you. I think well, it's it. But that's a point. In a way, the whole point of the CV exercise is that what we've got here is an outstanding candidate. Exactly. Yeah. Who doesn't have the CV that matches that, and it's not because they don't have the substance in the CV. It's about how they have written it, isn't it? So this is a classic example. It's a trap that you shouldn't fall into. I mean, I can understand if this was done by somebody who didn't have much information there. This person has got, uh, uh, I mean, like you said, it's a high-flying person, but exactly. lost in the way they've done it. And I think that's really, they're doing themselves a, dis, uh, a disservice if they do that. So I think this person, a little bit of help from um, anybody, you know, who's supervising them, we can, you know, this person will go far if they did that. I think uh, she should really do with a kind of, uh, you know, mender. She need to find uh, a mender, not only for the CV, you know, just how to kind of, uh, you know, just uh, improve herself in, uh, you know, various aspects because uh, she's doing a lot of things. Uh, so right. That's a, that's a point we should make, uh, Siddiq. The point we're trying to make is what we cannot do is we cannot embellish a CV. We cannot add things to the CV that doesn't exist. But this is exactly the example where you've got the stuff there and where we can help us trying to formulate a method where they're able to make this into an excellent CV. Because like I said, you can't make up the matter that is that the material is there. But it's how you present it. That's the whole point of this workshop, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, uh, Dr. Rias. Yeah. Can I give you another CV then? So probably. Uh... Yeah, we'll have a look. I think I'll do it very quickly. I think um, time is the problem, isn't it now? But uh, yeah, so it's been excellent so far. Great reviews. Are, are you able to see this CV now? Uh, it's loading. It's still waiting for it to load. Perhaps it's because PDF okay, is taking. Okay, it is, uh, yeah, it's come up now. Yeah, okay. So something starting with a doctor R is that right? Yeah. Yes, yes, that's the one I got it now. Um, so can you just make it a bit more smaller? Um, so I can do the view options here myself. Um, ratio. Yeah. Okay, that's good. So this is um, another CV. Now I think I've just had a quick look at the CV before. Um, and I know this person as well. So the point I'm trying to highlight a few things here is this is a classical example of a new person who's about to come to UK or this person is actually in UK, is going to come to UK soon. She was in the UK before. And this is, I think, um, a, a perfect example of uh, what most of you would be or about to be who are about to come to UK. Right now. The, the point about a CV and the point about this whole process is a CV is a process. It's not going to happen in a day or two. This is a process that you've got to build up a CV in a period of one or two years or two or three years, especially if you're coming to the United Kingdom. And we already heard from uh, interesting observations from the pre previous uh, um, uh, comments that, you know, you might be doing the work. It's about presentation. It's about saying what you have done. Yes. And saying what you could do. Now, we're all aware, people like me and who are, you know, recruiting from overseas, we know that there's so much you can do within the constraints of being being in India. But having said that, you've got to try to make the most of what you can do. That's the most important thing. And you've got to plan yourself in such a way that you can do lots of stuff in India before you come here. And then you can do a bit of stuff over here after you come here to make your CV look good. Now, there are a lot of questions about how you can do an audit in India, and we're going to cover that in the Q&A. Now, going back to the CV, the presentation, it actually says what they have done. Um, there is a bit of, you know, your personal statement. And, I, you know, we, we talk about this personal statement. We want to be very, very clear in a personal statement. What do you actually want? So I would normally recommend people to say, I have a short-term goal of getting a training post in the United Kingdom. A long-term goal, I want to be a physician in the specialty. Simple. You know, we are all busy people. We don't have time to peruse so much of paperwork. We all want to know is a quick look. So this person wants to do medicine. That's clear. Yeah, that's your personal statement. Yes. And work experience, of course, you know, I would like a tabular form. A tabular form, there was a lot of examples shown before because we can avoid a lot of text because a lot of the text, the problem with your separate jobs, most of your jobs, and you put it separately like this, is the issue is most of them will be the same. So you can't separate the wheat from the shaft. You can't actually separate the important things that you actually want to know. So if you put in a tabular form, it would be very, very good. Though this gives a lot of information, that's what I would do. Now, what's, what's important thing about this CV is this doctor, particular doctor, has come and did an observership here in the United Kingdom and also done something similar 
similar in India. That's very important. Now, a lot of people say you select a hospital, you work in India. If you want to come to the United Kingdom, you, you work in a hospital where somebody has got some exposure to the United Kingdom. It could be somebody who's been in the United Kingdom. It could be somebody with MRCP and you work with such an individual. You can actually try to do some of the things that you do. And that's what a good thing about the CV is. And moving on, there's a one important bit in the CV. You always get quizzed on your personal break. If you had a break, a career break for any reason, it could be you're going to have a baby, it could be a personal reason, it could be somebody's unwell, you got to state that in your CV. And that has actually been stated over here. You probably don't have to ex explicitly say what's happened, but it's always nice to put a, you know, put a reason to that break because you could have done anything. You don't know. So you need to let them know what actually happened. And breaks are not a problem in this country. You know, people don't mind you having a break, but you have to substantiate it. Even for GMC purposes, when you go for registration, you've got to explain why you had the break. So that was something good that's done on the CV. Um, going back, if we, if we move down the order, if we talk about this, again, there's far too much of information there. There's too much of text information, which sometimes we can and get lost in translation. So I would actually make it very, very, uh, you know, very, very succinct and, and a bit more precise, if, if you know what I mean. Uh, and again, going back again, if you've got the personal pres presentation, we, I would actually recommend the sort of um, sort of format that Dr. Rafiq has already mentioned earlier on. Uh, you did talk about your presentations and your skills, which is which, which is good. Again, it can be a bit more, um, you, you know, precise. Um, I mean, in this case, it's probably done a pretty decent form. And if you go down, again, Again, going back to what I said, what I'm looking for is what is different in the CV. I'm looking for a publication. I'm looking for some sort of auditor QIP. And when you think about people coming from the from from India, the big difference you've got to think is all of your CVs are going to be reasonably same. The difference is if you did an audit in India, if you did a publication when you're in India, that stands up for me. So you are actually looking different from the rest. So that's the most important thing when you think about CVs is how do I look different from the rest? Do how I put my information in a very concise and precise order in which I can make, you know, I will let the uh, the consultant or the person who's looking at your CV make a quick judgment. So I think with that, I think so the, what I would say is a few things on this, get the order right, make it very precise and concise, make sure that you get some sort of work done in, in, in India. And also I would say, you know, put your, your, your breaks in, any reason why you had the break and make it, make it very, very clear. Try hard to get an audit, some sort of audit experience of audit uh, or, or publication in India. Uh, thank you very much. Well, thank you, Arya. That's a kind of an excellent uh, review. I'm, I'm sure that person may be uh, uh, listening to all this in India. I'm sure all other uh, you know participants those who are uh, kindly send their uh, CVs, uh, listening, taking their message. Now, uh, Dr. Bijo Mohammed, uh, could you just? Uh, we are a bit of uh, you know short of time. Oh, so absolutely. Quickly run. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, just want to make a comment to everybody that the people who put their CVs out there have been really brave because it's, in a way, you know, I think uh, we, are, we are actually tearing into these CVs with the best of intentions, so not to take anything personally. I, I think this is, this is a good CV, but we could actually make this a lot better. And I think it's a lot of the points have been already made. It's about the format, the font, having tables, splitting up information. So, for example, just touching up uh, initially on the objectives, you know, just the use of language and grammar. So acquire the best of knowledge and skill, become a proficient and compassionate doctor. You know, that's that's what we are as doctors. We're supposed to be proficient and compassionate. So think about the language you use, get people to read through and work out. It doesn't tell me what you want to do by working in the NHS. So what I'm looking at is what is your objective? That isn't coming through over there for me. Um, so just, just moving on then, uh, I mean, a lot of these are, are okay, but I, I'm not really worried about uh, the primary school qualification and secondary school qualification. Once you're a doctor, I know how you got there. So think about those sort of things. Having um, some of the employment history in a table and what you've done during that posting would be much more useful to me rather than having to go through quite a lot in detail. So I, I think it's just giving a bit of thought. Like I said, the information in the CV is very good. It's just the way you, you present it. And if you just move on to the second page, Siddhik, it is, um, you know, there's a lot of information of that I had duties or, you know, I was also given duties in the department. What, I, what again, I'm looking for in the CV as I'm looking is, how do you compare to an F1 in the UK system? How do you compare to an F2? So if you're out there trying to get employment in the NHS, think about what is expected of an F1, F2 or a CT grade, whatever grade you're going to apply for. And think about using the parity and the terms that we are more familiar with over here. 
just moving on a little bit more, uh, things about awards. When I look at award, I'm looking at a medical, I'm thinking it from a medical sense, you know, have you got awards for projects you did? Have you done presentations and that sort of thing? Forget about our primary school or, or you know, those sort of things. The research experience, what I want to know here is what was the role of the doctor in doing the research experience? What was the outcome? What happened after that? Did they present it? Did they publish it? So, so think about not only what you've done, but from an interviewer point of view, they want to know what else can you do? If you come and work for me, what is going to be the output that you can provide for me and for the system? Finally, moving up to the, the last page, with the presentations, I'd like to know where you presented um, and what was the outcome of those presentations. And in this CV, the teaching experience is, isn't visible to me. So, you know, even if you're a, a medical student, you're still teaching your juniors. You know, if you're a house officer, you've taught your medical students. I'd like to see some of that information here as well. So on the whole, I think it's a CV that has all the right information, like everyone else has said. It's just tweaking it, getting other people to read it, getting the formats right, cutting down on the text, getting boxes in, and, and just improving it overall. So that's that's my comments. Yes. Really. Thank you, Vijay. I think that's a kind of uh, you know, good summary for overall uh, take home message. One is uh, all the CVs, what you have seen, there's a lot of text and a lot of uh, over. Uh, you know, information. So just to simplify it at one or two page and the uh, context that is a career objective, I think uniformly most of the career what you've seen is a, some kind of cliche, just make it very simple. And third one is what are the information you put it, uh, put it through a kind of someone you can, uh, you know, understand for example, dates should be there and, uh, you know, the, you know, whatever that kind of uh, essential information for, uh, uh, for any data, what you put to, uh, to substantiate it or to, uh, to qualify it. Now, uh, so I think uh, probably we have seen all these kind of CVs. This morning, uh, I just, uh, you know, asked uh, one of my uh, FY, one of my, you know, house officer uh, to send, you know, he, he has a CV in my kind of hospital uh, uh, records, but I just asked him to whether he could, uh, you know, send me his CV. I thought I will uh, uh, show you that. Just maybe just uh, to wrap it up. Now, uh, is it uh, visible now? Is it on the screen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so, so this is a, a, a one of my house officer CV. He just sent me this morning, actually. Um, now, if you look at, I wouldn't. I mean, of course, this is a very good CV for a house officer. And uh, so, what you look at here is, he put all the information there. Initial career statement. He clearly say what he has done and what he wants to do. Very simple statement. My GP rotation has been extremely useful insight into primary care. Where I've been able to improve my diagnostic skills and management plans. I'm interested in either pursuing a career in general medicine or general practice. So as simple as it is. And then all is the uh, two years of experience is put it very clearly. One, two, three, four, five postings. Where was it? What was the time? And then each one he uh, covered the essential, responsible for covering in patient ward and observation. Here it is covering general surgical patients, uh, psychiatry, covering respiratory and rheumatology, whatever you know information he's got. And then uh, qualification, as simple as it is, he just put his, uh, you know, what he has been up to. Latest, what he's done is part is a part one, and then a BBS, and uh, uh, is schooling. Again, uh, awards, just uh, two or three. He's put it, course and contract tendered. He what exactly it is, and where it is, and what is the uh, time scale. And uh, quality improvement project, what he has done. So he has been involving three quality improvement projects during my two-year foundation program. I'm currently working on a project assessing antibiotic prophylaxis to current duty within my GP practice designed, implemented, and carried out the PD essay cycle. I have presented my findings at a practice meeting and received. So all the information is already there. And uh, teaching experience, he put it nicely. Uh, because he's just an FY1, just a house officer. He just put what exactly is involved. Say, for example, he said, uh, year to OSCE revision day, he just uh, contributed as a, you know, a feedback oriented observation teaching and leadership. Again, he's a uh, foundation officer, feedback oriented. He took some leadership there, chair of a clinical neurology society as a medical student and team leader for medics in primary schools. Excellent. And interest and hobbies. Of course, he's a kind of nice, good uh, musician, even though he doesn't, as Baiju said, Biju said he doesn't play for India, but uh, he's done really well. Uh, during which I've set up my own band and his plays. And uh, so I think that's a kind of very uh, positive CV. So this is a kind of two page CV, all the information is there in the correct order. So 
uh, I think uh, uh, most of you are looking for uh, jobs in the kind of initial period. Probably this is all what uh, you know we need. Now, um, so now we move on to uh, some of the uh, question which is uh, coming through uh, kindly. Uh, uh, Can I just come in there for one second. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the point exactly we're trying to make. When we talk about the CD, if you look at the CV, the way it's formatted, there is no color, there is no photograph, there is no bits and pieces here and there. So when we say make your CV stand out, we don't mean by the colors and belts and whistles on it, but actually the material. And this is exactly a classic example of that. All the material that is needed is there. So you should let the work speak for itself rather than the actual CV and the color and the and the highlights and the boxes. So I think that is the important thing. So when we say a standout CV, don't get the wrong message that you're doing something the way you're doing the CV is what matters. No, but what's in the CV, what's in the CV is what makes it stand out. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, so I think the, the bottom line is everything is in the presentation. Yes. Now, uh, can we uh, move on to the, uh, I think there are a lot of uh, questions coming through the uh, chat box. So can we ask uh, uh, Siad and Rubas to kind of take yeah. over? And, uh... Uh, thanks, Dr. Siddiq. Thank you. Siad, Siad yeah. looking yeah, at all of this, looking at yeah. all of this, you know, being in the minority and being the non-medics here, Yes. you know, we were nearly bought by Riaska to join the medical world. But you know, the scrutiny, this extreme scrutiny on the CV, now we have second thoughts, isn't it? What do you think about all, the, all of this? That's what I was thinking as well. I've seen quite a, a few, few good CVs and uh, it looks like a lot of, a lot of criticism on that. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I know it is positive. Um, everyone takes it as a positive criticism uh, to improve themselves. Well, I think it, it, it yeah, I, I agree with you. I will be hesitant to do now. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. So, moving on to the questions. So, what we have done is we have listed all of your questions in these slides. So, apologies if you have any new questions, we might not have in, been able to put into the slides. So, the first question by BN, uh, I can see Siad has put a tick. So, my assumption is this is answered, Siad? I think um, I think Rafika already answered this. If uh, if if not, we can, uh, if if happy with that, we can move to next one. All right, no problem. I'll I'll just let's move on, and we can. Uh, yeah. And I think question by Mr. Dubai, Dr. Salman. I think this is also uh, covered in one of our presentations. Uh, that's a tick. Yeah. All right. Time enough for us to read, so that uh, you know you finish. Sure. So that's the first question by uh, Mr. Asad Abu Bakr. Uh, can you please speak something about the scholarships? I, I, I think uh, this goes, I'm not sure what exactly the context of this question. This is not whether uh, to put the scholarship in the CV or the, how you get scholarship. I'm not sure what is the uh, context. If it is about how to get a scholarship, I think uh, probably that is not within the remit of our uh, uh, talk now, so probably I wouldn't. Uh... Yeah, I, I saw the question as it came up, Siddiq, and it looks like they were asking if there's a possibility of scholarship. And I replied back to say that you don't need scholarships to work here because you get paid for the work you do. So scholarships are only if you are looking for education. But because you work and learn here, you get paid, so you don't have to worry about the scholarship. Rubas, can next? Uh... Okay. That's from Mohammed Zohair. He's asking if it is possible to get an audit done as a GP. And yeah. if yes, can you please provide an example? Now, I'm not sure. I had answered this question. I'm not entirely sure if this, uh, this person is in the United Kingdom or the person is in is in India or, or, or UAE. But the answer to the question is, as a general practitioner, you can, you can get an audit done as any healthcare practitioner, be it primary care or secondary care. Now, if it is in the United Kingdom, if you're a GP, they got one of the most important advice I would do, give to people who want to do audits. If, of course, if they're in the United Kingdom, it's quite easy because you go to the audit department, there will be a lot of audits that happens either in the primary care or in the hospital. The department will give you the list of audits that's happening. And quite often, the supervising consultant you're working for, if you're doing an observership, they will be currently doing an audit or they will be looking to redo an audit. So that's the best way to get hold of this sort of, you know, the, 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 the easiest way to do it. The other way is to get hold of your immediate senior. You may have uh, your SHO if you're a house officer or you have your registrar, they might be already working on something. You just tag on to them. You just tag on to them and say, I'd like to get involved. I'll do the data collection.
collection for you. Quite often, that is the first step of for people trying to do an audit. Now, the question, if the question is happening in India, I think that's going to be a, a wider discussion in this panel saying how how do we do? And I think perhaps at this stage we can talk about it because there's a lot of questions about uh, how can people do an audit in India. Um, I, I will put one or two points in, and then others can other panelists can fill in. Now. When I, we used to work, one, like we saw that CV, which I actually uh, analyzed, um, that particular person worked in one of the hospitals in India where we used to go and we used to provide support. And we put that sort of culture of trying to do some audits there. So uh, let's say if you have Calicut, you have MIMS Hospital, there will be some consultants who actually worked in the United Kingdom. If you go to the, the, the one in, uh, in Enlachlan, there will be some people who have sort of English style experience. And there, there will be audits and standards. The only problem is it's not there in the plate for you. You've got to go and find the plate. You've got to go and find and prepare the plate. That's the biggest difficulty. But the important, the, the easier bit is there is going to be a standard. You go to the NICE standard, go to the international standard, find that standard. And then you can find that case or that's sort of that particular um, the, the problem that you need to address once you get that standard. And then you've got to find an individual. The fact that few of our CVs show that audits have been done in India shows that it is actually not impossible. It can easily be done. And when, I, when we talk about audits, we're not talking about high level audits. We can look at very basic low level audits, simple things. Yes. And that's what I got to say. If others, any of the other panelists, if we're talking about specifically about doing audits in India, what sort of things people can do differently? Can I just come make a comment? I think. Um, uh, just reading through the chat box, there's a lot of uh, um, sort of fixation on having audit departments and somebody else doing that job for you. I mean, I've worked in hospitals where we haven't had audit departments and, and we've still done audits. So sometimes you have to be proactive and take the responsibility. So just giving a simple example, you know, if you, run, if you work in an emergency department, you're a house officer, you get people coming in with chest pains. You can easily uh, take these details of the patients that come in. You can see if they're getting prescribed the things that they need. You know, are they getting an ECG? Are they getting, you know, if they had a heart attack, are they getting an aspirin, clopidogrel, or whatever you want, statins, beta blockers, et cetera. And you could then have a list of 50 patients, 20 patients, 30 patients. You could then compare if you're doing it according to guidelines. So audits can be technically done anywhere without having a huge amount of support and it's the will and the systematic way that you have to do it. So that's just my comment that you don't have to necessarily have a fully blown system. If you do, it makes life a lot easier. Um, collaborating with people and getting other people to do it and being consistent is the key thing here. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Can I come in? So yes. the important thing for us to understand in audits is to have a standard. So if a hospital is one where there are local guidelines and there are local standards, take that. So like everybody said, you know, if your local guidelines are that a patient with, um, say, sepsis needs to be given antibiotics within an hour, if you have it, you audit against that standard. If your local hospital doesn't have those standards, take standards from anywhere else. There might be WHO standards that you might be looking at. So it doesn't have to be something that you have in your hospital. So if there are WHO standards which says that so-and-so should have TB treatment for six months, you can audit it and see whether your practice in your hospital conforms to that standard. That's what audit's about. It's about auditing its standards. And it doesn't have to be local standards you apply. You can apply international standards. So don't be put off by the fact that my hospital doesn't have clinical guidelines, doesn't have audit departments. It's your motivation that matters. And you searching for the bit that you want to do that matters. Okay, thank you, Dr. Rafiq. Yeah, all, the, all the points are relevant. So one thing what I would like to say is, Yes, you can do an audit in India. You don't need an uh, audit department. You don't need a kind of huge support. You don't need a medical records department where you can collect a lot of records. But having uh, also, as a Dr. Rafiq said, you don't need a kind of a, in a clinical standard for your own hospital. Any idea, say, for example, like a hospital, you're working in a kind of small clinic, still you could do it. You could uh, uh, you know, collect data. And if you don't have a huge uh, medical records to go back to, even you could do some sort of a kind of a prospective audits. The other thing is the numbers. Num number doesn't matter. Even if you're doing with a 20 patient, 30 patient, 50 patient, uh, that's uh, enough for you to understand that process and to get something out of it. So yes, all of you can do a, a, a audit in India, wherever you work. If you are working even in a general practice, kind of uh, you know, single-handed GP practice, still you can do it. Right, okay, next. Um, 
Because I think that this is uh, where uh, uh, just on the same uh, on the same note. There are, sorry, um, there, on the same note, there are a few more questions in order. I think maybe we can try to complete yeah, that. Yeah. Time. Yeah. Uh, there is the question saying, uh, any minimum time period during which data should be collected for audit? No is the answer. There is no time period. You just the time you set the standard so you can say let's say i looked at the number of myocardial infarctions that happened in 2019 between january and uh, july for six months so you decide that and you decide the number of course if there are more numbers for an audit depending on the condition if it's a common condition you need a larger sample size the audit looks a little bit more uh, um, you know credible but the, the whole point about when you guys do your audit for the first time is to get some exposure to to doing an audit if you're going to do a high quality audit you always need some more support but low quality audits and some sort of audit, what we are looking for is not you doing high quality audits. We're looking for some exposure of audit that you have in your country and that you have the knowledge and what, what an audit means. And that's number one. There's another question here. Do we need to follow the same portion, patients in the re-audit? We are not auditing the patients. We are auditing the care. So we're not auditing as how a person was managed. We're auditing of how that condition was managed. So we are actually looking at a group of patients for that period for one year, like I said, and then we put an implementation plan. And the next year we audit for a different group of patients, but within the same period. So we are actually auditing the condition and we're seeing if that, if our practice is close to that standard, if, 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 if that makes any sense. So I think that answers those, those two questions and I'll probably give the other questions to somebody else. Um, um, I think uh, probably what, uh, you know, uh, Riaz, what we could do is so we could just maybe in our uh, uh, WhatsApp group, we could just afford some maybe a 10 or 15 ideas, just simple ideas. Indeed, so that, that's, that's a very, very, very good idea. Like they are not able to get the ideas. What ideas? Rubas, can you identify any more audit related questions? Uh, I need to go through the questions. No, not a problem. I think if it comes, uh, it comes when. Well, oh, okay. can, I, can I just add something, Riaz, while, while they're looking for the questions? The, you see, sometimes we talk about audits depends on where you are in your training. If you are just staying in a department for three months, then your duration might be a problem. But if you're doing a post-graduation, then you're doing it for two or three years, then you can do the full cycle. You can do the audit in the first year. You implement your change of practice within a few months, and then you can re-audit again within six months later. So within two years, you can do a whole PDSA cycle where you audited it, you've implemented the change, and you've re-audited it to see the outcome. So you can actually do it. The second thing I would say is, in a country like India or in some place where you want to genuinely make a change, then audit will help that change. So don't pick an audit just because you want to do an audit. Also, if you can align it to some of the issues that you're facing locally in that hospital where you've identified the problem in A&E, then try to address that as well. Then that's the genuine purpose of doing that audit. Always bear that, that, that motive in mind as well. Yeah. Yeah, um, and, and I think I'd like to add on to that. Now, it depends on, uh, one, one thing I would add on is, it depends on what level you're trying to apply in the United Kingdom. Let's say you want to apply the a house officer level. Yeah, so the purpose is clearly, it should not be an audit done for the sake of an audit, there should be a clear idea of that audit. Let's say, on the other hand, let's say you're an orthopedic surgeon and you want to apply for an orthopedic job. So when you do an audit, when you're an orthopedic person, we expect you to be a bit more senior and do something which is more relevant to the orthopedic specialty, which you want to do. If, if, if you know what I mean. And it looks a lot more credible when you want to get a job that actually you've done an audit in your specific area of, of interest. And equally, if you're not decided what you want to do, and you want, it is not necessarily that you've got to do it in that area that you want to do or you aspire to be in, but it's always nice to find that sort of area because it actually shows your interest in that area. Let's say you want to do neurology and you've done, a, you're, you, you, you've done your basic medical training and you want to do neurology. It's always nice to look for an audit doing strokes, for example, so that that actually shows an interest in that particular area looking ahead uh, but but that's that's always not possible but i think you know when you're in india you have the flexibility to go and find out and find out the hospital you want to work in find out a consultant you want to work in it gives you a little bit more flexibility to do that that's how you got to plan yourself you know find that particular person or individual who may have that little bit of expertise to actually guide you yeah i don't know if anybody wants to take this one how does an audit become replicable if it's not recognized by body i don't know if anybody wants to take that question do you want to want to say something quickly about this because I think there is a confusion that there is a uh, something has to be recognized, or something has to you know agree with the uh, findings, or there may be a, a certification. Biju, do you want to come, or shall I just? Uh... I think Biju had to leave by five o'clock. Oh, yeah. Must have left. Okay. Now, uh, no, there is no, there is no need to have any kind of recognized body for you to give a certification that it is uh, to be done. As long as you are done the thing, 
you are uh, you know gone through the process and if somebody ask you how you did each step if you are able to explain it this is what i did this is what i did why i did and this is what i found and this is what i did with the result and that will be enough there is no need for you to have anybody else uh, you know recognizing it next one i think this is another question for the audit uh, uh, i don't think this is covered we, before we, we covered this yeah we covered oh, okay this. Yeah, I think we 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 covered most of the questions in order. Let's move on, and we can come back to the audit. Um, okay, I mean, there's one question about audit here, which I can find. Um, can we do an audit in a, any hospital where we do not currently work? I think that might be difficult because, you know, you have a duty of care. I mean, what you're trying to do from an audit is you're actually trying to do the audit of the patients you are involved with. and because of data protection purposes and because of you know your relationship and confidentiality you would not be able to do an audit where you are actually not currently involved in care now if you were involved in care before with those patients and you're trying to do let's say you worked in 2019 in that hospital and you want to do an audit to work in those patients in hospital during that period but currently you're not working there that might be possible because at that point of time there was a relationship for you with that hospital but i'm not sure if you can actually do it in a separate hospital where you're not um you know where you're not currently covered i I'm, i'm sure i'm not sure i'm sure that the hospitals won't allow you to do that okay apologies for on a very different note uh, you know thank you for all the cvs uh, you know which we received we were not able to cover all of them we hardly covered around five or six of them for the rest of the cvs uh please uh, be ensured that uh, these will be reviewed by our experts and will be sent to feedback uh, one to one yeah yeah i mean there's another question here about um about an audit i i don't know if uh, dr rafiq wants to take this can a medical student do an audit in the college yes so um, the thing about medical students is they can do anything they can do audit they can do research but what happens is as a medical student you're only in one area for a particular period of time so the best way to do audit or research as a medical student is to latch yourself on to a, a one of the consultants or one of the other doctors or one of the seniors one of your postgraduate students because then you can actually have a focus on what it is that you're doing because otherwise what happens is if you have no support within the team that you're working in and you have no relationship with them it becomes tricky so the best way to do an audit as a medical student is actually you speak to your consultant and say i'm hoping to do this audit can i audit your patient so if it is you wanting to do a, like a, a repeat exam you want to do a, a, an audit of the uti patients you go speak to your local nephrologist or whoever it is that's looking after them and sit down with them and say this is what i'd like to do so once you have their support then there's no reason why you can't and a lot of publications with audits and research publications there will there can be medical students as first, first authors but there'll always be a senior supervisor for them so you should always have a supervisor but yes by all means go ahead and do that and and that would be good yeah i think there's another audit question here i think i'll i'll ask dr i think dr biju has to leave uh, i don't know if dr fahiz is still here mr fahiz i don't know if he's still here i'll, I'll find out but uh, dr sadiq there's a question here about audit and i think this is something very basic question uh, are so, you reading that is a question which displays on the uh, Uh, yeah, and I'm reading from the chat window actually. Oh, yeah. Know. Yeah, yeah. So there's a question over here and uh, it says over here suppose a patient in cardiac ER was given aspirin and clopidogrel. Uh how to know and how, what to put in in an audit whether it helped. So that's a very very basic question and I think it's it's about a better understanding of what an audit is. So Dr. Sudeik do you want to explain that? What what is the question? The question is suppose a patient in cardiac emergency room was given aspirin and clopidogrel. how to know and what to put in audit whether it helped i, I think that's again probably the you know uh, the uh, the fundamental understanding of what audit is so for example if a patient with a cardiac you know obviously i don't treat uh, you know cardiac anymore if the patient standard is the patient should be given aspirin and clopidogrel and you know what were the dose for how long if that is a standard what actually you are auditing is whether that has happened or not and then if uh, you know that has not happened what are the reasons and how you can kind of uh, you know rectify that probably you know uh, the person who saw some of the patients were too junior they didn't know about it then what you have to do is there would be kind of a teaching has to be done or there should be a kind of protocol should be available in the uh, you know visible area so so it is uh, not uh, how it helped that's uh, you know going to kind of a little bit more of uh, you know out of the uh, audit uh, remit is that uh, 
Okay, Riaz, this is what, yeah, what... Yeah, I, I think I would agree because um, you know we're seeing cardiac patients. I think it's not about being cardiac patients; it's about just understanding basic understanding what, what it means. And audit is actually not for a single patient. We're looking looking for our practice for a group of patients for that particular condition. So you're talking about aspirin clopidogrel given for all patients coming with suspected MIs over a period of time. But we have a standard that all these patients who have a definite um, and STEMI or a STEMI should be given aspirin clopidogrel. Have we done that for all those patients over a period of time? So that's how the audit should work. And for that, we need that standard. And the standard will be any guidelines, which is European Society of Cardiology guidelines. It could be Indian Heart, Heart Society guidelines. So you just can follow any of these accepted international standards. What's happened there, Riaz, is they've confused research and audit. Exactly. I think, yes. yes indeed. There's a difference in that research. That's not what we're looking at. We're looking at standards, aren't we? Yeah? Yeah. And now I think, uh, I don't know if uh, Afsal is here. Afsal, is still here? Uh, yes, Dr. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Afsal, there's a question here. Huh? There's a person who said, I completed my MS ENT last year and now in the UK preparing for MRCS ENT. Is it possible for me to get an audit done by just doing a, an observership? I think I must have touched that upon my talk, but do you want to say when you're do, doing observership, you can, can you do an audit? That's the question. Uh, yes, I think because I know a few uh, who have managed to do an audit during your observership. But again, you need to keep in mind that you'd be having only like four to six weeks of observership in most hospitals and uh, you need to be proactive uh, to find a, a very good supervising con consultant uh, and then you need to uh, you need to find a topic where you can quickly do the audit or the other thing is that you can also get involved in an audit an ongoing audit you can in, uh, involve in the data collection and then involve with with one of the senior doctor with regards to analysis and stuff so that is another way as well. So definitely, uh, this is one thing that you have to try to do when you're doing a clinical observership, which would also add into your CV and obviously would help you to get into your first job as well. That's great. I think we'll just move on from audit a bit. I think um, uh, Fahiz, uh, Mr. Fahiz, um, can I ask a question? I think this is a bit of a, uh, um, not a controversial question, a bit, a bit of a different one because it says over here, can we show throw some light on the question that he was asked a question about paid speakers for companies. Now, an individual is going and doing a paid speaker as a paid speaker for various pharmaceutical companies. And the question is, can I mention that in the CV? Yeah, that he's done these teaching sessions, but it's, it's a paid sponsorship. And the only problem caveat here is that person may, I presume, is in India. So the Indian rules and our rules may be a bit different, but what is your take on that? I'm, you know, I, I'm, you know, I don't know if I want to do, put you in that spot, but anybody can come in. But can I can I ask you what's your take on that? I unmute uh, uh, Faiz. Faiz, unmute yourself. Uh, sorry, can you, Rubas, can you try to unmute Faiz? Um... Yeah. yeah, 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 that's fine, yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, you're, you're good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that's an interesting uh, that's an interesting point. I think um, it so conflicts of interest are, are always um, uh, they're always controversial, and I think unless somebody asks specifically, uh, then if you've given a talk on a particular subject, you probably don't you don't need to declare whether it was sponsored or whether it was invited now if someone asks you then then you should you should declare that so i think if you've given a talk on a particular topic and many of us will have done um and we would have had our accommodation paid for we may have had our travel expenses paid for then um you know if we've been invited to speak at a meeting a national or international meeting then usually uh, we'll have will have received we may not have re re we may not have received an honorarium or a um, a specific amount for speaking but we will have received some um, uh, some benefits uh, in kind for our travel expenses and our accommodation so I don't think to be honest you need to declare that unless somebody specifically asks now you know if we're involved in in um, public bodies and uh, for instance, if you're on on a nice committee, then you have to declare all of that. Uh, and the same if you're public, if you're publishing, usually journals will ask now if you if you have a conflict of interest, and then you have to declare it. But I think on your CV, um, and I, I wouldn't. I mean, I think your CV you need to play to your strengths. 
but don't highlight your weaknesses or your deficiencies. Um, that that would be my feeling. Can I can I Bidu, just Bidu, come, in. come in here? Yeah, I think let's just come in. Very, I, yeah. Uh, you know, apt person to say this, to answer this. I, I very much agree with uh, Fahiz. I think you have to distinguish here between what the CV does. The CV is a, is a selling document and it highlights your strengths. And in the teaching section, you know, whether you're paid for or whether you're doing it voluntarily, you know, it is, it is a teaching session. And most of us are, are health professionals. We follow the code of ethics and we do things in a very ethical manner. We wouldn't you know, necessarily, you know, we wouldn't want to distort the truth in any way. So a teaching session is a teaching session. From a CV point of view, I wouldn't distinguish it. I would put it as a teaching session. On the other hand, if I'm doing a, a public lecture, for example, and if I've got PowerPoint slides and I'm doing it to an audience, then I always have a conflict of interest declaration there. And very much it is important, especially if you're talking about certain pharmaceutical products, you have to be very upfront right in the front that, you know, you have received an honorarium from this company and this is relating to that. If it comes to publications, you have to always declare if you're putting in research grants and if you're putting in applications, they always ask you right at the outset. So those, those are very clear. So I think there is a distinction here between CV, teaching, and there's a distinction between presenting it in public fora and applying for research grants. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't put it on the CV as a simple answer. Okay, um, so any, any other comments on that? A fundamental question to answer there is that, like everybody said, you're trying to sell yourself. And the idea that you don't have to declare that you were sponsored is one thing. But equally, you need to see just because somebody sponsored you for a talk, is that talk relevant to put in your CV for that particular job is the more fundamental question. That's more important than whether you should declare it or not. Because if it has no bearing, because we all know medical reps approach has to come and do talks sometimes. And you know they can give you a set of slides and you give a talk. But if it actually has no bearing on the job you're applying for, then actually you're doing yourself a disservice there. So make sure it's relevant to your particular job that you're applying for, rather than just one of those things that you did. That's the more important thing for CVs. Okay, I think there was a lot of uh, discussion on that. Thank you. Um, can I ask for, here's another question. There's a surgical question here. Regarding logbook for surgical specialty, for someone who has finished post-graduation five years back in India, do they still need to maintain a surgical logbook? Now, I don't know if it's retro retrospectively or it's currently, but the question is, somebody has finished their postgraduate training, let's presume it's MS training five years ago, and they want to come to UK, do they still need to maintain a surgical logbook? I think, you know, if, you, if you're asking that question, it's, it's always better to have as much information about what you've done uh, as possible. So although it's tedious to maintain a logbook, it's the only evidence really of what, of what you've done. And certainly, um, I mean, I, I, I know some of my consultant colleagues continue to keep a logbook and they have to, I mean, we, we all have to, for our annual appraisals, um, uh, have evidence of what we've done, procedures, endoscopy, um, surgical procedures, and, and there's a national bowel cancer audit, uh, which we have to submit data to. So actually it's a good discipline to keep and it's a good habit to get into. So my answer to that would be yes, you should continue to record every procedure that you've done, outcomes, complications. So if somebody asks, you've got that data, rather than having to go and find it retrospectively um, if, if people are interested. And I think for surgeons as well, outcomes are very important now increasingly. So you need to have some evidence that you, you know what your practice is and what your outcomes are. Yeah, I think I, I think a short answer to that is keep as much as evidence as possible for you know for you for you if you want to come to the United Kingdom. We always like the evidence. We always like your your claims to be backed up with evidence. You can't go back. It's quite difficult to retrospectively go back and back at that evidence as you go collect the evidence. That's what it is. That's what I recommend. There's another surgical question here for you before you uh, you know. Uh, yeah. You, it's, uh, it's, it's getting into, this is a, this is a box standard question that we get asked all the time. Is getting into a surgical residential or a training program almost impossible for a foreign medical graduate? Yeah. It's, you know, it's probably easier now than it ever has been because we're still, we're, we're, we're not able to fill all of our surgical training uh, numbers now. I mean, surgery used to be very competitive. I mean, it's still competitive to a point. But actually, if you go, I mean, I sit on the um, ST uh, training um, uh, interviews on the panels um, and actually it's it's not easy to fill all of those posts. So I think 
now is probably the best time if you're interested in getting a training number. Um, but you need to know how to play the game. And I think, you know, um, uh, efforts like this are very helpful because the portfolios, uh, your por portfolio really, there is a very structured scoring system now uh, of what's required to get um, to, to get a training number. So I think, um, and the earlier you do that, the better. There's always been a, a debate about when you should come to the UK. Should you come early? Should you come after your M MS? Um, and that's, I mean, that, a lot of that depends on opportunity. But I think, um, but but now, as long, you know, if you've got publications, if you've got some presentations, if you've done the relevant courses, if you can score those uh, those points, then your, your and, and obviously you've got to have your, the status, your visa status is, is um, appropriate, then uh, you, you can be, you can be competitive, but time spent since graduation can count against you. So don't leave things too late. Yeah. Um, again, I, I think um, the, the bottom line is it all, it's supply and demand situation that actually yeah. decides what happens here. And then surgical specialties are a lot more in demand compared to, to what happens in India. And this is the best time, as 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 Swahis has mentioned. This is the best time for surgical graduates. I think it's, it's one of the best times ever, isn't it? Because I think yeah. people are able to get into surgical training now. So if you're planning, you know, don't wait within the one next one or two years. Try to come to UK as soon as possible for for surgery. Uh, so that's yeah. what um, you know. Because over the last fifteen years, I've been supporting people, uh, you know, to come to India. This I feel this is the best time, um, and. Uh, there's, there is another question, and I think I'll pass this on to uh, Rafiq, uh, uh, Dr. Rafiq. What advice would you give to someone who just finished medical school in order to build their CV up? Uh, maybe the, uh, Rafiq and Dr. Sudhi can actually fill on this. Medical, uh, somebody who just finished medical school, what advice would you give to build their CV up? And that's a broad question. Yeah, it is a broad question in sense. If you're planning to come to the UK soon after medical school, there is nothing you can do between finishing and coming here. You should have already built it up previously. Um, but if you've got a bit of time that you're, you're doing some uh, work there, then anything that you do can fill in. So I think uh, somebody after the study try to answer that as much as we can. So it depends on what you mean by what can I do after you finish. It's... Um, there's not a lot you can do after once you've left medical school. It depends on whether you're still within an organization or not. When you're within an organization, then you go back to doing everything that we talked about. You go back to doing your teaching sessions, trying to get an audit done, uh, trying to get a, a quality improvement project done, um, uh, see any publications. When you say publications, case reports, poster presentations, um, build up your, if you attended any conferences, you can put those in. So all those basic things that we said needs to be put in there. So. It depends on where you are. You either go back into what happened in medical school and then fill your CV with that, or if you've got a year or so before you come here, then during that time you try and do this. All right, uh, Dr. Sadiq, you want to come in here? That's a very good question because all what you're trying to say how to improve your CV is something done over a period of time. So if you, so everything is, for example, like you want, you're a medical student now, you're starting your point. House of a job, you're planning to come to UK, maybe after one year, two year, you plan, okay, what I need to do to get my CV, I need some teaching experience, how I can get it, okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to, uh, you know, every week or every two weeks, I'm going to uh, teach the medical students so, so and so time. And you do that, and that goes in your TV. So you have to plan it. Okay, leadership skills, okay, how I can prove that I've got some leadership role. You think about, okay, within the two years time, what kind of leadership roles are accessible to you, what you can do. So for example, like uh, in your hostel, the mess secretary, somebody, not mess secretary, maybe a bit of controversial, everybody wants that, but say uh, something else, uh, uh, something which is not very you know, lucrative. Someone else sees that nobody else to take that job. Okay, you volunteer, okay, I'm going to take this in the next one year, being that kind of uh, you know, representative or you know, whatever it is. And then one year you do that job and then you put that into your CV. Again, uh, audit, okay, you got one year to plan an audit, you plan, okay, within one year, I'm with this hospital for next one year. So I need to plan an audit, who is can, who can help me make a plan and do that audit and put. So whatever you want to go in the CV, it takes time. So you have to have a plan, 
in the first month or two itself okay this is what i want to do over a period of two months time this is what is possible this is what not possible and this is uh, doable not doable and then work on that kind of a target then i think uh, you know you should get uh, you know something get into the cv right thank you um i think uh, one of our moderators uh, rubas um i think he needs to go uh, rubas do you have any any final words for us i know thanks for ha hanging on guy and putting up with a bunch of doctors you know no 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 right i can do that and uh, thank you very much actually i have supplemented my learning curves on the medical uh, you know world hopefully when someone next comes to me uh, from my technical side i have a lot of points um, but i won't go much deep into the auditing and all the clinical research about a you know a civil engineering world but definitely there's a lot of a uh, lot of things for you know food for thought so thank you very much everyone yeah and i got to say before rubas goes i think he's the one who did all this putting all those questions in the slidos and doing all the technical background work for us uh, and, and helping us with all those questions uh, and uh, i let, need let everybody know that rubas is an iit graduate so he's not a simple civil engineer he's one of the best in the business in india so you know he's done in and my thing done to this no. yeah uh, okay thanks rubas um, thank you um there's a question here and and uh, actually this is i think i'm sure afsal can help this is back to audit and i think dr siddiq mentioned about this before can you show us a basic example of an audit pdf or an audit template and can you just to have an insight on how to plan it i, I think you know i think we can, we can of course do that in the whatsapp group like dr siddiq mentioned but i think one of the things that we could do is because it looks like audit is the flavor of the day isn't it and everybody wants to know how to do an audit and i think we have to do a specific audit workshop which lasts for about longer because we only spend about 10 minutes on it and i think that's something we can do if there's a lot of interest i'm sure a lot of these experienced and senior people are here they're they're quite willing to spend their time i think that's something we can do to help all of you out and to give you basic insights because it is a very alien concept to most of you it's very very difficult to get into the concept we have to tell it once two times three times 10 times it was drilled into my mind so many times when i first came to uh, to, to uk so it will take time for you to understand that concept because you have never done it here the medical stu students start doing it in a year 3 so they are quite familiar with the concept so that, i think that's how we can do that hopefully um there was another question here um which was um so a lot of questions about audit um Oh, okay. There are lots of questions about teaching activities. Yes, and I think I think that's the sort of. So we covered the audit. We covered a bit about lots of the other things, uh, and we covered a bit of the CVs. Now, can the question is, can teaching be done in the hospital institution, or has it to be better done in a conference? Now, I think that's again a basic understanding about teaching and education. Biju, do you want to come in here? The question was, can teaching session be? Biju, are you still there? I think we do have to go before but yeah, if, yeah. yeah. so can teach, that, yeah. can teaching be done in the hospital institution or uh, you know or or has it to be done in a conference that's the question I I think this is this is coming back to the issue of uh, fundamental understanding of what we perceive as teaching in the UK so uh, here in the UK we expect our medical students to be teachers we expect our house officers f1s f2s to be teachers registrar's consultant you start teaching from the day you enter medical school and you go on till the day you you sort of finish medical practice so it doesn't necessarily have to be in a conference the teaching that you do to your juniors to non medical staff in uh, teaching rounds unit rounds all of this concludes teaching what is very useful though is to get feedback on that teaching and to know how you can improve as a teacher so if you do teaching whether it be in a normal unit round or whether it be in a conference it's useful to have feedback and it's useful to to know how we have done so that you can constantly improve yourself um, but when you present it in the cv it's important to be very clear in terms of presenting it in what have you done where have you done it and how has it helped or you know how has it changed things thank you yeah um thanks bijo i think i'd like to add on that you know because you know one of my keen interest areas is teaching and i spend a lot of time on this teaching and what i would let people know is whenever you get an opportunity to teach somebody in any setting being in the hospital being it in the community what you need to do is like i said you you should do the teaching but you need to show evidence that you actually taught somebody so you know we have feedback forms over here um, you know in the united kingdom is standard feedback forms if you google through the royal college websites and you just look uh, just google say feedback form for teaching if you 
print a couple of these feedback forms out and give it to the people who were actually in front of you. There's an evidence that you have done the teaching and you got the feedback. And you go you do, do an evaluation report on that teaching that actually satisfies that sort of particular teaching. Now, of course, if you're in a conference, you'll get a certificate or somebody else is supervising, you get a certificate. But that's one of the best things I would say. And this is something which you can easily do in India. It's easily, audit can be a bit tricky. You can still do it, but teaching can easily, easily do. So I would encourage all of you to do this. One of the simplest things you can you can actually do. Now, there are a few questions about observerships and, uh, you know, and I'll ask Dr. Siddiq to come in here. Um, can we do an observership in the UK? How to secure attachments in the UK? how to do that. And this is a common question. And I think Dr. Siddiq has been in that area for about 20 years uh, with, with another organization called Mufid, helping with attachments and things. So the question is, how do you, can you get an attachment? How do you do it? You know, what, 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 what are the ways of going about doing it? Yeah, I, I think, I think uh, you know, most of the people who comes here do, you know, will be looking for an attachment. Now, obviously lately the, uh, you know, getting a clinical observership is difficult, difficult in the sense, uh, more of kind of, uh, the formalities previously if we just go to a consultant you know can you take uh, somebody used to happen but now the uh, it goes through the uh, hr and quite a lot of uh, procedures now the best way to do is uh, obviously you the timing because you have to come to uk to get your plap uh, uh, 2 exams now the best thing is one is uh, you try to get an attachment if possible before your plap exam you may have to you know come maybe one month two months before the exam so that you can attend the plap course uh, before that, you can attend the uh, uh, clinical test because that can really help you to do your uh, to do well in your PLAB exams. So that's the the timing. So you have to think about a clinical attachment uh, as you planning to apply for your PLAB two exam in in UK. That's the first thing. And second thing is now how you find out. Now the best way to find out is I think uh, most of you are coming uh, planning to UK would have a, some sort of you uh, know connection. Maybe a, one of uh, your colleague, maybe somebody, your classmate, or maybe a, you know somebody who's senior. All of us, I mean, I, I suppose most of us should have a, some kind of a connection. I think that may be the first thing you need to, you to hook on to. Say, for example, if you have one of your classmates is there, you already you know here starting even maybe doing the first job, uh, try to speak to them to see whether he can just uh, you know get you through one of the uh, you know consultants working in that uh, you know their department or somebody he did an attachment or someone he knows may not be working but maybe a, you know someone from his place so uh, generally kind of sending a kind of cv to just a hundred of uh, consultants or department usually uh, doesn't work but uh, you know targeting through your contacts when i say contacts I mean it don't need to be a kind of somebody professor here even maybe a just a house officer or maybe you know and then obviously you may have to look at kind of, uh, you know, uh, may not be not one. If you have a kind of five contacts, try to get through all the five contacts. You kind of, uh, you know, standard letter, you know, email, which I was just mentioning how you, you know, put the email and subjects and all that. And then to, uh, you know, uh, somewhere you'll get it because there will be, a, you know, different kind of uh, logistic issues and uh, other uh, requirements for your, for example, like your kind of, uh, you know, hepatitis screen and other occupational health. And there are, you know, different formalities for different uh, hospitals. Uh, but uh, I think uh, most of the people, those who are coming here are able to, uh, you know, get uh, clinical attachment. Now, obviously a lot of, uh, you know, our uh, uh, consultant within this group, like Riaz, uh, you know, myself, uh, you know, Dr. Rafiq, and you have been kind of, uh, you know, supporting maybe uh, you know, hundreds of doctors to come here in different ways. So um, yes. It can be done, but you have to be kind of, uh, you know, you have to pursue, pursue uh, the kind of, uh, you know, your effort. You may not get on the first task, you know, first time you send to a consultant, you may not get a reply. So you may have to kind of, uh, you know, knock many doors. Is that uh, reasonable? Yeah, 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 that's good. I think it's, 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 it's a, um, because the coronavirus crisis now, a lot of trusts are, have reduced that observerships, but that's probably a short-term problem. And, and some trusts make it very, very difficult because the first thing you need to do when you need to get a consultant, uh, sorry, you need a consultant in the United Kingdom to accept you to take you as an observer. So, or an attache. And if once that happens, then it's down to the HR department to do all the paperwork that's required for it. So you need to find one of our friendly consultants willing to do that. And they also consultants, even if they're happy, they'll have restrictions as to how many observerships they can have in a particular time at one particular point. And there's also, uh, uh, you know, the restrictions around 
what you can actually do as an observer in certain hospitals, you can do bloods in certain hospitals, you can't take bloods, you can see patients, you can touch patients and so on and so forth. So all these things you have to, sorry, you've got to make it very, very clear. Right now, um, there's another question regarding, uh, I think we will wind up with next two or three questions. I think there are still a few people, about 80 people listening to our conversation. So maybe we can wind it up in about three or four questions. Um, if your work is uh, published in a recognized Indian journal, how do you use it as an evidence in your CV? Biju, that's for you. If your work is published in a recognized Indian journal, how would you use it as an evidence in your CV? I'm, I'm not quite sure what the questioner means by that. I mean, if it's uh, just going back to what I discussed in the talk, it, it was going back to referencing and the citation of the article that the person has presented. So. Uh, if it's in a published peer-reviewed journal, you would put it under publications. Uh, you would reference it as per the referencing methodology we discussed earlier, the Vancouver, the Harvard system that's normally used, and it comes under the publication aspect of your CV. I, I guess from that question, the I think the person means, is, is the journal recognized? Is it a, a highly impact journal? Is it a very high peer-reviewed journal? And, and to be honest, you know, when you're coming into the UK, uh, as Fahiz mentioned earlier on, the fact that you have a publication, and uh, Rafika mentioned, others have mentioned, the fact you have a publication itself is a, is a positive. Um, clearly depends on the state of job you're coming for. If you're coming into a house officer job, F1, uh, post lab, or whether you're going to register a job is slightly different. But the fact you have a publication and you have a start there, um, it doesn't matter. Uh, if you've got a genuine publication, do put that on your CV. It doesn't matter what uh, the quality of that might be. Okay, thanks, Biju. Um, can I ask Fahiz the next question? Fahiz, um, Fahiz is still around? If, yeah. Fahiz, I think you need to be unmute. Yeah, okay, unmuted. Yeah, the, your question is, uh, if your the publications are not in reputable or famous journals, um, the professors have mentioned their names first and ours is the third author, so the question really is, if you're a third author, is it really valid? Because in India, it's typical for the professor to have the first author, and you can never, have, never be the first author. But it's, it's pretty straightforward. But what do you want to say to that? Yeah, you know, a publication is a publication. So I think once it's published, then other people can cite and reference. And I think that's really important. And again, going back to, you know, publications and audits in your field shows a commitment to your to your field. So whether you're first author, middle or senior author, once you get, get it into the scientific literature, then you've left your mark. So I wouldn't get too worried or, or, or bogged or, or focused on where you are or where you've published. Now, obviously, we all want to publish in high impact journals, but the reality is we, we can't because there are only a, no, a small number of those journals. And there's a lot of politics behind um, you know, what gets published and who, who gets published. And those of us who are involved in editorial committees or editorial boards of journals will, will understand this. It's very much to do with, you know, what the hot topics are at the moment, who's funding your journal, all of these things. And as we're moving towards open access, that also has an impact because um, that will skew what gets published, uh, especially in the less, in the, in the lower impact journals. So yeah, so to answer you know, briefly, uh, if you can get a publication, that's the important thing, because that's a line on your CV. It doesn't really matter, uh, you know, where it's published. And obviously, you, you want you want to have a, a breadth. So if you can get some high impact journal publications, that's great. But if you can't keep on going, and one thing builds on another, and you'll get to the point where you'll you'll be involved in a body of work that gets published in something in a journal that's high impact, and that may be your that that's all you need. That's going to be the big break for you. But I think. Yeah, don't get too worried about publishing in high impact journals. That's my opinion. Well, I think uh, that that big, big brings on to another uh, popular theme. I think a lot of questions around publications, and, and a lot of questions around citation. About sorry, Rafika, Dr. Fika. I just want to say something. And, and sometimes what you are need to think about is what you get out of it. So ultimately, if you've been able to submit a publication uh, as a, uh, and it's a paper and it's been published. What you gain from this is the methodology of how to write a paper for publication. So once you come to you, you can use that and then fly. So that's important to do by submitting. So not only about the CV, not only about the CV, 
<laughs> you learn the method of how to do, how to submit a paper for publication, and that will stand you in good stead in the long run. That's important to understand. Yeah, I mean that's, that's a very important point. I think what we actually look when you get a publication is, especially at the unit doctor level, is are you aware of the methods, how to do it? Are you into it? What are the sort of uh, your, your knowledge and experience? It's not necessarily about getting into Lancet or any any JM or Nature. Um, very very valid point, Dr. Rafiq. Uh, so I think that again, I was just trying to say there's a very another theme that's developing. People want to know about publication how to do it, how to reference it, how to do citation, how to, you get an audit or a publication, how to mention that in your CV, in the citation bit, isn't it? So I think that's another area which I think people like Dr. Sadiq and uh, uh, Fahiz and uh, Biju, maybe if you have time, you know, how to put that in your CV, that'd be a very, very good time. Maybe we can come back for another important theme and session that's developing. And a lot of questions around there. It's always quite helpful to do that in practice rather than telling you how to do it, you know, because it's, it's, it can be a bit of an alien concept if you do it that way. So that's useful. Um, Just uh, come here, I think, uh, sorry. I think the overall theme what you're coming here is the confusion about uh, what can go on a CV. I think mm -hmm. that everywhere teaching, or well, somebody has to be a professor, it has to do kind of very high international teaching. Publication has it to be a Lancet or something else. Leadership has to be a something, you know, you are done a, a leader for the whole hospital or some clinical that no 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 even if you are uh, working for a consultant job here even small things matter so for example uh, teaching even if you do a kind of a simple teaching your medical as a pg if you student medical student that is teaching you can proudly put it as a house officer if you put as a you know teaching a student you can put it if you teach a nurses you can put it. What are the teaching you do? You can put it, but put it in a structured way that is kind of, uh, you know, you do what, not what you teach, what was that kind of session? Is it a classroom teaching or whatever it is? So don't worry about you have to be a teacher. That's one thing. The same thing about the publications or presentations. You don't have to have a presentation in Lancet or a Nature or a PMJ. Say, for example, there are a lot of local, uh, you know, if we are talking about uh, India, there are a lot of journals, even. In a Kerala state or a Tamil Nadu, there are local orthopedician journals are there, and you'll be able to get a, a you know case report or maybe a simple publication in that. But of course, that has a, that will have a value because you the job what you are applying for is not for a professor job, maybe a researcher job, maybe a kind of a middle grade. At the most, it's a consultant job. So even if you get get a publications in a kind of local uh, Kerala orthopedician journal or Kerala ophthalmologist journal, that is more than enough. The presentation. You don't have to present in international conference, even as a house officer, as a PG. If you do a simple presentation, maybe a poster presentation in one of our, uh, you know, IMA meetings. If you are able to do a poster, it's a you know, Caligat or Cochin them arranging a meeting. If you're able to do a presentation, there you can put it. Okay, I did a present the presentation so on so on so on so on right in this particular meeting day. That's you know because the most of the job what you're looking for is that kind of job, maybe a house officer, SHO, or uh, something middle grade. So you're not looking for uh, you know other jobs. Again, uh, uh, audit, you don't have to do a kind of an audit with a big audit department with a lot of uh, complex, no. Where are you work? Basic thing is that you have to get that idea what audit is exactly it is, and then put that audit to whether maybe 50 patients in a kind of a hospital with only uh, 25 beds or 20 beds, still you can have a quality audit in the department. Only thing is you need to know what exactly that audit, that concept has to be clear. So all things what we talked about, it can be done in India where you are working without any of this kind of uh, you know, big support you think uh, you need. I think uh, getting the ideas clear is most important. So that I think all the time, I think most of the questions are coming from that kind of misconcept. So it is not, you know, you, all you can do a kind of a very excellent CV. If you have one year or two year, you can prepare all of it. All of you are in this panel, I mean, in this listening, wherever you work, you are not limited. You will be able to do something from even you are looking at a remote place, you should be able to you know, get to a good CV if you clearly understand the concept and work on it systematically. Okay, excellent. Um, I think now for Rafika, there are a few questions here, Rafika, for you about the CV per se, okay? Uh, one is, uh, it says, um, uh, is it worth mentioning post-internship experience in fields other than the one a person is currently doing a postgraduate? Doesn't make it irrelevant. So, but essentially, if you're a if you're a, if you're a medicine PG and you talk about something else other than medicine in the field, is it irrelevant to put that in your CV? Well, the first thing is there are two things, two parts to this question. One is 
if you say you are coming here to do a PG in in geriatric uh, in um, movement disorders, but you did ophthalmology when you were in India, I'm not talking about anybody in particular. But what you cannot do is you can't leave a gap in your CV. You have to explain what you did there, and what you then do is if you think it wasn't relevant to what you did, then you write why it is that you did that, and then why you changed your career when you came here. So don't leave gaps in it. But obviously, if it is something that you did that will help you towards getting a job, then then expand on it in a lot more. But if you're not, if it's not something that you're looking to work here in, you still have to write that there because you've got to explain what you did in that one year. But what you can then do is preface that with saying that I did this job particular there, and then after that I decided to change my career. You can be honest. You know, you got people in this country who did uh, geology for 20 years and then came into medicine, or did medicine and then went into chartered accountancy after 15 years. Career changes are very common in this country. In India, once you join uh, D ophthalmology, you cannot apply for anything other than MS ophthalmology. It doesn't work like that in this country. You can change careers, you can change fields, you know, you can go to medical journalism, you can work for a pharmaceutical and come back. In fact, it adds flavor to your CV to do that. I mean, obviously, it has to be relevant, you know, it's how you pitch that. But there is absolutely nothing wrong in being honest about it, but then tell them why you decided to make a change. That's all that matters. So be honest, but put, yeah, you have to put it in, no question. Yeah, I think the, the I think the, the crux of that answer was be honest. You can do anything in this country and you're right, you have a right to change your career, you can right to come back, you can do that. It's not a problem, it doesn't look bad. The important thing is be honest why you did it and you can have a cre credible explanation uh, rather than faffing around and beating around the bush that sometimes you can do that in India and then they catch you out, that's even worse. Um, the there's another question here, and can I come back to Fahiz? Fahiz, um, there's a question here saying uh, the ophthalmology doctor, um, you know, did not have a logbook then. Now she wants to come, and retrospectively, is it a good idea to try to get hold of a logbook? I think you're uh, you're you're on mute. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I think it depends how much effort it's going to take. I mean, I, I wouldn't, it's not always easy to go back retrospectively to go through all the uh, theatre log books and try and identify what cases you've done. So to be honest with you, um, if you can do it relatively easily, then fine, do it. But I don't think, I mean, for that specific, this, if you look at the CV that we, we looked at for the ophthalmologist, I mean, her CV is, is outstanding. So actually that, that's enough to get you shortlisted. And then uh, if you get shortlisted and you're interviewed, then in your interview, you can say, look, I've done this, I've done, I've done that. Your, refer your uh, referees can vouch for your experience. So no one's going to be that bothered about how, how many cases you've done, assisted or... So I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't say... If you're more junior, then it may be more important. But actually, if you've got a strong CV apart from that, those are the things that are going to uh, that, that they're going to push you ahead. So I, I wouldn't spend you know days and days trawling through all these operative logs trying to get the information. And invariably, it won't be accurate because you, you won't be able to get the complications. You won't know the outcomes of all those patients. So all it will be is numbers. So it's not really worth the effort. That would be my opinion. Uh, I think it looks like a good good one because when I came here, I I, I had some medical evidence log after finishing my ophthalmology and decided to do become a medic, and I think that all went to waste. So, <laughs> so, um, so, um, and I, I think the important thing is the CV is brilliant. It's just about restructuring the CV. I think with that CV, most of us, I think most of us here in the panel are pretty experienced interviewers. I think we would like that CV. So that's a good thing for you. If that makes you feel any good. We gave you a bit of a thrashing on the CV, but uh, that's because the CV was excellent. Now, I think, that's, I think the same person has asked a question here, and this is for Dr. Sadiq. Can you give us a few tips on filling forms on, on NHS jobs? Regarding various headings like describe about formal teaching training, describe surgical skills or other boxes which require some description. Basically, the question is about how to fill an NHS jobs the application form, any particular tips, especially around teaching, around surgical skills and how to be descriptive about it. I, I think it is exactly what is in your uh, and some of the forms may have a, uh, in a limitation of uh, number of, uh, you know, uh, characters you have, but uh, but even if you don't have a, a, a limitation of characters, you have to be kind of very uh, precise and to the uh, uh, to the point. Uh, any information what you give, I think 
uh, I think that's one of the principle. If you're giving an information that has to be a kind of, uh, should have all the kind of features, say for example, where, what, and uh, when, uh, for example, it has got a title. So if you're giving a medical student teaching or if a second year medical student, the more you specify, okay, uh, second year medical student teaching, you're on a weekly teaching or, uh, you know, for one year, two year, if the more you qualify, it will have a more kind of, uh, kind of, uh, you know, authenticity rather than oh, I'm teaching uh, medical for so many years. That uh, you know may not help. Uh, so any, uh, so uh, again, uh, you know, some of the um, all the forms, the forms can vary. So so it depends on uh, you know what exactly the kind of uh, you know question they are asking. You have to a little bit extract from your you know CV and uh, you know, put it on. And the other thing is what I, again what I would advise you is uh, once you've done your CV, uh, please uh, show it to someone else. Uh, one is for proofreading. Always, you know, someone else looking at will have it. Not necessarily, a, you know, kind of very senior person. Not necessarily. Uh, even maybe one of your colleague or maybe a just, uh, you know, uh, some of your senior supervisor, somebody who it is. Always, you show your uh, CV. And also, if you are putting an application form. Uh, online application form again. It is helpful for you to, uh, you know, to show to one of your, uh, you know, peer or colleague because sometimes, uh, you know, spelling mistakes can be an issue. Grammar can be an issue. Also, you know, the way you know someone else uh, looking with a fresh eyes, you know, it can be a, you know, it can be a simple suggestion. We can make it, uh, you know, much more, uh, you know, effective. So that. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think um, the, the whole idea is when you put that application form, it actually should be reflecting what you have done and and it should be a good reflection of your CV. The amount of description you put into it will depend on the amount of work you have done for it. For instance, if that job is a vitro-retinal fellow, so you have to put that VR experience there in that sort of descriptive in the terms of numbers and figures, especially if it's a surgical. So it's, it, it, it is probably related to what what, what the specific job is and always always very important when you put an application form look at the job description of the job you're applying for so when you put the application form the job description will state what actually is required in that job you have to always match that job description to what you're actually putting in the application form so when the actual interviewer or the person who goes to the shortlisting goes through that they can actually say this is a job description the answer is actually matching the job description so that's very important but that should not that should match corresponding to your experience yeah, so that's very, very important. And that's something which we sometimes have to proofread. That's where the proofreading element may be coming into it. Yeah, I, I think that's again an important point. Probably we didn't uh, you know, stress enough in our uh, uh, you know, sessions. Most of the jobs now, even for the most senior job, there is a, something called essential criteria and desirable criteria and how they're going to look for the proof. Uh, I think uh, some of the uh, job description, if you see, uh, this may be as a, even given as a kind of a part of the, uh, as a tabular column at the end, some of the job. So essential criteria, there will be, you know, most of the time it will be very kind of statutory things, should have passed MBBS or if have a GMC registration, whatever it is. So you make sure all these informations are there, all the essential criteria information, you put it into the uh, application or CV. Again, desirable criteria. So for example, again, uh, a publication is maybe a kind of desirable criteria rather than essential criteria. And also, they will look at how this is going to be assessed. Some of the things assessed from the uh, application form itself, some of them would be uh, through the reference, some of them would be through the uh, uh, during the uh, uh, interview. So I think uh, looking carefully for these criteria is very, very important for uh, you to fill out that kind of job. Because even if you have a all, lot of desirable criteria, and if you there is no essential criteria, you may not get shortlisted. It, it can happen. Brilliant. I think we're coming to the end. Maybe a last couple of questions. We need to wind up now. So uh, just one thing I need to tell people, you know, but people are, uh, there's uh, this common question that gets asked and you, know, you have your gap between your writing a lab exam and you're not doing a job one year or whatever you're preparing what i'll always recommend is to you know when you do that you can do a lot of online courses you can do things that you don't have to work, particularly work in hospitals and you can justify one of some of those times you used up while you prepare for the exam you know just do some online courses do something else that will be cv like how to do an audit there are online courses how to do an audit things like that which actually help you when you're actually in a break or when you're when you actually can't work right uh, there's one question about you know, the, the USMLE and the, the PLAB is going to end and it's going to be going to have the UKMLE 
option that's going to come. Um, and how different is the UK MLA going to be? That's one question. I think it's coming in 2022 or 2023. Uh, I don't know, Rafika, do you, do you have any? Yeah, I have a bit of insight into that. And so basically, currently, the club exam is a standalone exam, which has no bearing to or any relationship to any of the exams that the medical students in the UK do. So what the new exam is trying to do is to have one common theory exam across the board, across UK, because in the UK as well, every medical school has their own final exam, which are not related or not comparable, really. So they're planning to bring one exam that's across the board for every medical school. And that will be the exam as well that people the foreign graduates. What we aren't clear about at the moment is what the format of that will be. Because if you think about PLAB, we're always used to doing multiple choice questions or single best answer questions. But the format may change to have, um, say, short answer questions. And so the actual format, we're not entirely certain of at the moment. But it will be the common. It's a bit like what we talked about the USML in America, that it will be the same exam that the local candidates do will be given to the foreign candidates as well. But that's just a theory exam. The OSCE will obviously, or the practical sessions will be separate for the foreign medical graduates. But the theory exam will be the same. But the format is still to be decided, but it will definitely be some form of combination of multiple choice questions and short, out of, short answer questions, I think. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rafik. I think it's time to wind up now. Um, and a, a big thanks to all of you. I think, uh, can I invite uh, uh, Mr. Rauf? Um, Mr. Rauf is one of the very few non-medics who have been patiently waiting for two and a half hours of gruel or three hours of gruel and uh, listening to all our stuff. Uh, the rest of the two people have escaped. So. So I got a big, a big, big, big congratulations. He's the one who's doing our website. He's doing all the YouTubes. He's doing all the sort of work, which you guys are having the benefit of after that. And he silences it in the corner and does it. So uh, Rafi, uh, Rauf is a, a senior IT engineer. He's into software business. He's done both our websites. I don't know what he cannot do in terms of IT field. So, and uh, you know, he, he, he's, he's alive. He's a backbone, to be honest. So over to Rauf to do the word of thanks. Thanks, Rajma. Can you can you hear me? Am I audible there? Yeah, yeah. I got on stream in that connection here, so yeah, that's great. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Vyas, for that generous uh, intro again. Um, I mean, it was it was quite good for me as well. It was a learning curve for me as well from my uh, from my techie side. Uh, there's a lot more lot for me to learn as well. Anyway, so slowly come uh, everyone. Uh, mashallah, that was a very brilliant session from the experts on how to make a CV stand out and. Um, and uh, I would like to express uh, my thanks on behalf of uh, Excel UK. Now, let me start by giving uh, glory to Almighty for bringing out another exceptional session um, during this uh, challenging time that for us all. Now, we owe our uh, uh, CG group our uh, commitment and obligation uh, who provided support from all angles and they richly deserve uh, our gratitude and I offer the same to uh, Mr. Zakaria MV, uh, Dr. Zadeh Ashraf, Mr. Nisam AP, Mr. Anas Vichu, and uh, Mr. Tanzil uh, Toha. Now, just like um, the other sessions that we had, uh, one can appreciate the amount of time and effort putting the team uh, behind the scene or in the background to make this a really sounding success, if I may. Now, Jazakal had the Excel UK Executive Committee, uh, the technical team, and our uh, moderator who did a brilliant job on the QA, CR, then reverse. Um, and uh, special thanks to the CG designer, uh, uh, Tanzil uh, Toha. Now, uh, I must also mention our uh, sense of appreciation to all the other um, uh, participants and audience here on the Zoom session and all our live stream on the YouTube. Uh, thanks to all, uh, all your time here and uh, hope this was a great experience and great learning for you. Um, and I request the participants uh, here to share one or more takeaways from this uh, session by commenting on our YouTube link, which I will share uh, shortly. Now, um, a good CV um, can be uh, monumental in standing out from the crowd in a job market, in a competitive job market like this, um, in the current uh, uh, job market. Now, in this session, this particular session was very structured with a top-notch um, presentation from the experts in the field uh, with invaluable sources of information. Now, there's a lot of takeaways, and I have a um, lot to highlight here, but I'm very conscious of the time, especially for the people uh, in India and other locations. So my words may not be may not do enough justice uh, to express the sense of obligation to this proficient team, whose time is, is worth a lot. I mean, it, I, know, I know the team, uh, the speakers and the panelists, and I know it's, it's worth a lot. 
and one can appreciate that. Now, I, I think it's like a sadaqal jari, and uh, may the Almighty reward you for your goodness, inshallah. Jazakallah to uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Rafiq, Dr. Riyas, Dr. Afsal Af Abu Akhar, Dr. Biju Muhammad, Dr. Siddiq, and uh, Dr. Fahiz Muhammad. Jazakallah khair. Um, hope all of you have a great rest of the weekend um, and stay safe. Thank you, Ralph. That was a very, very uh, detailed and excellent uh, vote of thanks. I think with that, I don't know if uh, Zakir Sahib uh, from CG has to say any last words and we can officially end the program. Uh, Zakir Sahib, if you want to say anything, it's, it's very late in India. I think it's 10.30. Um, Zakir Sahib? From CG? He was here around... Uh, He's still there. We can... Um, yeah, I can, I can see him there if he's there. Um, but I think we can officially close the program. Now, what, what we're going to do moving ahead, we are still going to have, like I said, we already have developed themes around, um, um, you know, detailed audit, detailed research, detailed publications. We are thinking about uh, soft uh, skills, communication uh, skills and all those sort of things. Whatever we can deliver through the online mechanisms. And now, uh, as a soft skills person myself, I like to do this face to face, but there's something we can do. So we will be uh, doing a lot of these sessions. Uh, of course, you know, our, you know, we are busy people, all of us, um, and we do lots of other stuff as well. But I think that's the way it's going to be. I put our email, excelukatraining at gmail.com com if people want to send any specific um, you know any queries um of course you know it will take some time for some of us to do this now one thing i'd like to particularly mention is all the people who gave their cvs the brave people the brave people who straightforwardly consented to put their cvs in public view a, a big hats off and big kudos to all of them a big thank you all right now we did tear you apart a bit uh, but I, I i do believe that that has tried to make it very good for you. Having said that, they were excellent CVs. And, you know, we are quite impressed. I think 20 years ago, if I was doing a CV like that, I would probably not even think about it before I came to UK. So, which means that things have moved on and you guys are doing a great job. As a token of appreciation and as a, as, as a gesture, what we're going to do is all those people who had put their CVs before the event, not now, who were brave enough and who came forward with their CVs, whom we have about 20, all of us are going to give one-to-one -one feedback right to them and our panelists have kindly agreed to provide support for them so we'll go through the 20 or so cvs including the ones we discussed and we will try to do that it'll take time it won't be immediate we will have to discuss with all the panelists but maybe four of us um, you know take about four, four cv each or something and try to cover that so we will we are going to do that for you and we will try to keep our word so a big thanks to all of you again let's end the program officially and can i ask all the panelists just to stay back um for a few minutes of catch up if that's okay